Oh. Okay. Um, Mr. Marshall, I have received notification that Emerson Field is having some technical difficulty. And they have asked if you can stand by. Your voice continues to drop in and out. I wonder where the microphone is on this. And I did get a notice that recording was in process. I, I see Amherst Media now in the attendees. Okay, they're telling me that they are good to go. So we are all set. Thank you. Okay. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of September 29th, 2021. My name is Doug Marshall. And as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.32 PM. This meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town's website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or be despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then please place yourself back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Jack Jemsek. Here. Tom Long. Here. Andrew McDougall. I think he caught Jack off guard with that question, but I am present. <laughs> All right, I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna, or Johanna Newman. Here. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and is reserved for comments regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Public comment may also be heard at other appropriate times during the meeting for the items on the agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so um, first item on the agenda for this evening is minutes. And uh, before, we, before I ask if we have any minutes for uh, review and approval, I wanted to just state that uh, for, for reasons that will become clear later in the meeting, Maria Chow will be taking the minutes for this evening's meeting. All right, uh, 
Chris and Pam, do we have any minutes for approval this evening? No, we don't. Okay, we have no minutes for for action tonight. Second, uh, public comment period. Do we have any public comments? All right, I'm seeing two. Um, Pam, do you normally uh, move people in and out? I usually allow them the opportunity to speak. Yes, they don't actually come over into the panelists. Okay. So the other thing that I wanted to let you know is um, I do have the timer available if you want to use have that available. Yes, I would like to use the timer. And uh, let's see, I'm seeing Yasmin Eisenhower first. Hi, Yasmin. Hello. Uh, just confirming that you can hear me? Yes. OK, great. Great. Um, I'm Yasmin Eisenhower, Executive Director of Amherst Cinema. And on behalf of Amherst Cinema, which is located at 28 Amity Street, I offer this statement to express the cinema's support of the town's pending decision to amend the official zoning map to extend the general business district to include a vacant parcel of land owned by the town of Amherst in the vicinity of North Pleasant Street, North Prospect Street, Cows Lane, Amity Street, currently located in the general resident district. As you may know from previous conversations and meetings with my predecessor and former Executive Director of Amherst Cinema, Carol H. Johnson, public parking has been an ongoing concern for Amherst Cinema. Our movie-going patrons are highly car reliant, traveling to Amherst from near and far within an estimated 25 mile radius and beyond. In the year 2019, the cinema sold more than 100,000 tickets, an average of more than 2,000 per week. These are not only moviegoers, they eat in area restaurants, spend in our shops, and help the local economy to thrive. So when our customers tell us that finding parking is one of their biggest frustrations, that is not only a concern to the cinema, but it has a larger impact on the Amherst community and economy. In the worst case scenarios, some of our patrons have had to leave their movies to feed their parking meters. It is our opinion that the scarcity and inconvenience of parking options must be addressed and is solvable. Rezoning the parcel of land to make way for destination parking is an important first step. In my, first, in my short tenure as executive director of Amher Cinema, my work has been focused on bringing people back to the big screen to experience the magic of the movies. And that hinges on creating a rich and holistic customer experience that will make people feel welcomed, wanted, and a part of our community. There are exciting developments to come as we envision what the future holds, re-engage with our community, and offer new films and educational programming. We are working closely with partners like the Amherst Chamber of Commerce and the Amherst Business Improvement District to collaborate on community programming. And on a national level, we recently learned we are a Sundance Festival satellite screen, one of seven independent art house cinemas across the US that will showcase a specially curated selection of Sundance 2022 films during the festival's closing weekend. I'm honored to be a part of the business community and the caretaker and curator of our cinematic home. Um, thank you, respectfully submitted. All right, thank you, Yasmin. I, I need to repeat that comments need for, uh, during this point in the in the meeting need to be about things we are do not have on the agenda. And uh, the rezoning of this parcel is on our agenda as the next uh, topic on the agenda. So at this point, uh, I will call on the rest of the people that have raised their hands, but please make sure that your comment does not apply to something else that's on the agenda. Uh, Next, let's let's uh, hear from Anne. Hi, Anne. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I am speaking 
on behalf of Laughing Dog Bicycles, which is located at 69 South Pleasant Street. And I'm speaking to amend the zoning map of the parcel of land designated in the agenda. Okay, can we have that comment uh, in a few minutes? Sure. These are comments not about things on the agenda, and the agenda includes CVS, the, the rezoning of this parcel. I apologize. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I see Lev Ben Ezra. Lev. Thank you. Yes, uh, I similarly misunderstood the instructions. My comment is in relation to the discussion of the temporary structure at the Amherst Survival Center later in the evening. So I'll reserve comment until that time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So I don't see any more hands raised. I think, Anne, that's a legacy hand that's up. And so we will move on to the first item on the agenda, which is the rezoning. Uh, so the time is 6.42, and we are at the zoning bylaw, the official zoning map, map 14A, parcel 33, rezoning. North Prospect Street to see if the town will vote to amend the official zoning map to extend the general business district, BG, to include a vacant parcel of land owned by town of Amherst in the vicinity of North Pleasant Street, North Prospect Street, Coles Lane, and Amity Street currently located in the general residence district. This has been continued from July 7th and from August 4th. Uh, Chris, do you have anything to say about this as an introduction? Um, we've been working on a, um, a proposal that's uh, related to um, what was advertised. It's not exactly the same, but it's related. And both Rob Mora and um, Nate Malloy have been working with um, the proponents of the uh, initial um, zoning bylaw amendment, and I think it would help if, if either Rob or Nate um, took up the conversation from here. All right, um, Rob, can we call on you? So yeah, Nate, Nate will be handling the uh, the overview of where we are. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Chris, Rob, Doug. <clears throat> the um, you know, I think that was mentioned before. Instead of, you know, what we're looking at is an overlay um, zoning district, right? That's uh, only for that parcel. So it's, you know, originally the thought was maybe um, contract zoning or some other technique to allow a parking facility. But after speaking with legal counsel, it really and you know, um, looking at different options, an overlay zone uh, is probably the most appropriate method for this property. Um, you know, it, it doesn't um, require covenants with the town or with other entities. It's really, um, and it would only allow just a parking facility. So every other use would be governed by the current zoning on the property. So really it is just an overlay to allow a parking facility. It's voluntary, um, you know, we're working on details right now with the proponents. And so, you know, in general, it, you know, it ha would have its own dimensional standards, you know, standards and conditions. Um, you know, zoning can't regulate everything. So there are things that the town would still be the property owner that could be managed through uh, lease agreements or through permitting. So, um, you know, an overlay zone would facilitate the development of a parking facility, whether it's a structure or a surface lot. Um, and those are the only things that would be allowed in the overlay. So you're proposing that in lieu of rezoning this parcel from RG to BG, that you instead uh, enact an overlay on the parcel, the underlying zoning would remain the same and the uh, overlay would describe the conditions under which a parking garage could be built? Correct, right. So it'd be like, you know, a parking facility overlay zone just for that property. All right, so at this time, do you have anything to actually proposed to the board or is this more of an information session this evening? Uh, this is informational and then the idea would be it could be continued until next week um, on the 6th. And so we're, you know, we don't have anything to share, uh, you know, specifics now. It's really just to receive comments and questions. Okay, thank you, Nate. Uh, Chris? 
So um, I would suggest that you might want to hear from um, the members of the public who came here to speak about um, the need for a parking garage, since there seem to be a lot of people here, and then continue the public hearing to um, October 6th, the next Wednesday. Agreed. Um, all right, so it looks like we have a couple of members who would like to say something before we get to public comment. Uh, I'll call on Andrew. You have three minutes. Thanks, Doug. I'll, I'll keep it under three minutes. Um, I was just reacting or, or just curious. I know uh, when we brought this up one other time, there was a question from a, uh, a citizen who asked about this being spot zoning. And Chris, I think you'd said that it, it really wouldn't because um, it's adjacent to other PG parcels. And I'm just curious what um, whether the this application of using an overlay um, would would constitute spot zoning. I'm 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 just asking uh, for the information. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Nate, would you like to respond to that? Sure. I mean, Chris has her hand raised, but I could say that it's not spot zoning. Um, you know, even if it was just rezoning that particular property as is originally proposed, it wasn't considered spot zoning just because of, you know, the proximity to a similar zoning district. But as an overlay, it's not uh, spot zoning. Thank you. Chris, did you want to say something? I just wanted to repeat something that Rob told me a while ago, which is that this is considered boundary. It's a boundary lot. Um, and and that means that it's essentially an extension. I think this is what it means, an extension of ex an existing zoning district that's right there adjacent to this lot. This lot shares a boundary with the BG zoning district. And so if we were to um, take some of the things that are allowed in BG and um, bring them over in, in this overlay that we're talking about into this um, district or into this property, I think it would be um, not considered spot zoning. We're taking aspects of BG in the sense that um, there are uh, public and private parking lots allowed in BG. Um, there are certain dimensional requirements that are allowed in BG that we'd like to bring over that would be applicable to the parking, dis uh, the parking uh, structure or lot. Um, and so we're really just kind of enlarging uh, what is, is allowed in BG, but Rob may have more technical um, explanation for, for this. Thank you, Chris. Rob, did you want to add anything? Uh, just that uh, as we switch gears from, you know, looking at the BG as a possible uh, change to a overlay, you know, it really takes out the question of potentially any spot zoning anyway, but I think both Nate and Chris, I agree with, um, you know, Chris's explanation is probably uh, was was really helpful back when we were looking at it as a change in zoning district to BG, but that doesn't look like that'll be the case as we move forward. Thank you. Um, Janet? I have, a, I would first a request for a little more information on um, boundary, boundary districts, um, maybe in our packet next week. I haven't heard of that before. Um, I have a question. Um, or I have a, you know, I was reading through all of the um, the parts of the packet talking about the CVS lot rezoning, and you know, I was reading Susanna Musprat's thing, and you know, lists of really good questions. Kathy Shane has questions, um, and I'm wondering um, how we're going to get those answered about in terms of you know this lot, this location versus other locations downtown, doing some kind of comparison, um, you know, in terms of you know, and then also, you know, in terms of location, you know, size of um, how many parking spaces, you know, we can go up to four or five stories on the, um, you know, LSSC light lot. Could we do more there? Is a spot on, off of um, Amity Street a better spot, or you know, does it? Have, you know, what are the pros and cons of those? We have studies on that, and um, I, you know, people are raising questions about road access, removing parking spaces to get onto Coles Lane. Um, are there, you know, what's the traffic impact on North Pleasant Street versus Amity Street? And so we have a list of really good questions that people have. And I think, you know, questions that I had just reflecting on this is terms of like, is this economically viable? viable? Like we're hearing it's a five or $6 million parking garage. 
if we're only adding 50 or 60 spaces, those are kind of expensive spaces. Maybe we can do it cheaper somewhere else or doing something alternative. And so I'm wondering, how are we gonna get that information? How are we gonna get those questions to ask? So if we go to town council saying, we make this recommendation for a zoning change, we're not just recommending a zoning change, we're recommending that a parking garage be built on this lot. And this is a better spot than two or three other spots in the downtown. So I'm looking for that information um, and I'm just wondering who's gonna provide it or when we'll get that. Um, Thank you, Janet. Um, Chris, Nate, or Rob, do you want to respond to any of those any of those questions? Uh, you know, certainly some of the questions like traffic and that sort of thing would come up when you actually had a design and you had some engineers involved in designing the facility. The financial viability is probably going to come when you put out an RFP and somebody either replies because they think they could break even or make some money. Uh, or no one replies because they don't think anybody could make money on it. Uh, but that's just my two cents. Um, Chris? I think Nate has looked at the um, other two sites pretty carefully, and he has some comments uh, to share about the other two locations. Um, he's read the reports and he's um, you know studied those as potential. So um, perhaps you'd like to um, recognize Nate. Oh, yeah, no, thanks, Chris. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think this, I'll, I'll this location, yeah, this location has been studied for you know decades as a possible garage and i think you know in terms of its size uh its location i think it's an appropriate you know site i think the amity street lot is too small you know the town doesn't own a lot of municipal property in downtown in the bg so i think that um you know additional studies you know a really in-depth study is not necessary um to you know uh, have an overlay district and nelson nygaard looked at it a bit when they did the parking uh, study in 2016 and 2018, and you know they cautioned about uh, cost as a municipal project, but as a private project, um, as Doug mentioned, I think that's not as much of a concern because it, you know the town's not outlaying the funds for it; it's a private uh, entity that would be spending their money to develop it and manage it. And so I think the location is appropriate. Um, you know, it's centrally located, and you know maybe that the town needs you know multiple parking facilities or multiple parking locations. So, you know, it's, you know, even if a garage was located somewhere else in downtown, it doesn't solve the problem of someone parking right in front of where they want to go. But this location is within a 15 minute walk of most of downtown. And so, you know, there are other locations people have mentioned, but at this time, you know, most of those are not municipally owned property or of the right size or location. So I think, you know, Town's thought too is providing an overlay district also could serve as a template for how to zone other properties if, you know, if this is successful. So, you know, sometimes parking is complex and it's not, you know, one solution for everything. This is, my thought is this is one phase, one step in um, helping provide parking. Uh, I, I appreciate okay. it. Okay, um, Janet, um, Sorry. I think, uh, can you mute yourself? Thank you, um, Maria. Uh, thanks, Doug. Uh, that's exactly right, Nate. This site has been studied for longer than my term, and um, and I agree with I forget who said it, but that all those questions about traffic, financial issues, um, those studies come after a design has shown up. Uh, zoning isn't meant to solve all the problems of what does it look like, uh, how is this going to be impacted. I mean. How is, what's this look like? I, I guess I'm confused why so many specific questions are coming up when we don't, yeah, this is more about um, planning for what could happen, not planning what is going to happen. So I think that laying this as an overlay um, makes a lot of sense if that's an easier path forward than the changing of uh, RG to BG. And we don't know all those answers until we study them and to study them before, um, the zoning change doesn't, you, you don't, you normally do zoning that way. We don't normally uh, design all the apartment buildings in every area that might have it be available, or we, we don't study every ADU and every parcel. It's, it's just not the way it works. So um, raising those questions after we have a design, after we've had studies makes a lot of sense. But um, to do that before we're trying to make this 
um, type of project possible doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and um, so I, I think that's great, Nate, just keep pushing forward. Um, whatever, you know, seems to uh, be not the easiest pass forward, but just the one that makes the most sense as far as, um, right, not making it seem like spot zoning, that it's something that um, relaxes the ability to have this project, but that the current uh, um, zonings, you know, um, you know, if something else comes up, there's still a zoning that project can follow. So I think that's probably a safe way to move forward, the overlay, I hadn't thought of that, that sounds good to me. Thank you, Maria. Janet? So as I've said before, I'm agnostic about a location of a parking garage um, or where it should be in downtown. I, I do think it's sort of astonishing that we wouldn't have any information as a planning board on traffic impacts, impacts on roads, whether we're removing pop, you know, parking, um, the costs of the garage, you know, what the deal is, um, you know, how many spaces, could we have more spaces in a different location? Um, is one more visible, more viable? Um, economically viable. Um, so I, I, you know, and so there we have so little information and we're sitting here again. And Nate, I appreciate your perspective, but please give me the data that supports that. And so we have some studies. Um, can we compare this, you know, the, the, um, the LSSC lot versus the Amity lot, maybe throwing in also the Bank of America lot, which sits, you know, because that could be combined like let's look at three alternatives, at least put a chart together with pros and cons on each, some numbers. If we are gonna build, you know, like if Mr. Roberts wants to build a five or $6 million lot on the CVS lot, well, maybe another lot that, that could happen on a different town lot across the street that's more accessible, that's easier to get cars on and off and has less impacts, you know? So I just find it odd that we wouldn't be as a planning board looking at all the aspects of a proposed garage in that location, because we're not just talking about like rezoning abstractly, we're talking about what that would mean realistically. And so, I don't know, when I read those, those the comments by Kathy Shane and all these things, I just think, well, this is some information, we're not gonna get all of it, but we're not even, we're just having, you know, we have so little information to go on. And if we, if, what if a garage is built there, it's not viable, it's not used. I have no idea how much money the town is putting in or not, I don't even know what the deal is. I don't know what we're talking about. And so I feel like I need more information before I can make a recommendation that this is a good light, you know, let's do overlay because this is a good spot for a garage. And this is what it means. Okay. That could happen next Thank week, you. but I do think we need more information. Okay. Uh, Tom. Sure, thanks. I, I mean, I think the way I'm, I'm thinking about this is that there seems to be this comparison of this lot versus that lot. I think if you asked anybody, the amount of parking spots we can fit in either of those lots might not be enough. So I don't know why we're saying this lot versus that lot when maybe both of them need parking lots and, and we don't know. I think what we're trying to do is figure out if we can put one on this particular location because it's an easy rezone as an overlay. I think the overlay helps get rid of some of the issues that people have about it potentially becoming some five-story building down the road instead of a parking lot. So I think this is a really smart decision to open this up and to explore it because we can't vet it. We're not here to vet the potential of it being an apartment building either. And we're not vetting it being a five times the size of a CVS. We're vetting, we're just sitting here wondering whether or not we can explore the opportunity of putting parking on this particular location. And that feels like a very positive thing for us to try to explore with the limitations of the overlay versus opening it up in, in a variety of other ways that um, people had some serious issues about. So I don't see it as an, as an issue that we're going to explore this and open it up for an RFP, whereby it's cost effectiveness, it's function, it's access and all of those things we can then vet and say, you know what, this is zoned for this, but this particular building is not gonna work in this particular site. And we will see this again as a building and be able to decide whether or not it meets your criteria for um, whether it functions on a particular site. But I think right now we won't know that until somebody pitches in the money and the time to actually show us what this might look like as a design. Thank you. All right, uh, does anybody else on the board wanna speak? 
seeing no one, uh, why don't we go to the public comment about this? Jack was raising his hand. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Johanna. Jack. Yeah, I just, um, I think uh, the only thing that I have, um, you know, on my mind about this is the, the BG versus the BL and the potential for the five story aspect, um, you know, for this lot, which is, you know, adjacent to residential. And I thought that was, you know, we're, we're putting trust into, you know, what will be developed there. And that that's the only thing that kind of caught me is like, um, you know, we don't want a five story thing in there, but, but the BG allows that. So how do we deal with that? Uh, and that's so the I, main sticking yeah. point for me. Uh, Nate, do you want to comment on that? <clears throat> sure, thanks. Yeah, I think, you know, as an overlay, um, you know, we'll have different dimensional standards that are specific to if it's a parking facility, right? So we can have our own setbacks and heights, as you'll see, hopefully next week. So I think that, you know, um, then there can, there can be discussion about if, what's an appropriate height in that location for a parking facility. And so I don't think that you know, we're, we're anticipating a, you know, a five-story building as big as say in the BG, but that's something that a, an overlay can, can regulate, it can regulate, you know, the size and mass of a structure and setbacks. And so, you know, that's why we like the idea of an overlay too, because the underlying zoning is in place for any other type of building, any other type of construction. And so, you know, those dimensional standards can really um, help shape what, you know, what the massing can be. Thanks, Nate. Andrew? Thanks, Doug. Um, keep a quick sort of fast follow on that first question, just hearing some of the comments. I actually, with the overlay is, it does sort of make it seem to me almost like it's more spot zoning, right? Because it's, we're, we're creating a set of standards for a single parcel. Um, I actually felt like it was less of a concern when it wasn't an overlay, but um, I, that said, like I support the, the, the proposition. I just, I, in the back of my mind, I just wonder, is this setting a precedent where we uh, might start creating individual overlays or create overlays for individual parcels? And I'm just curious if, uh, and you don't have to answer this now, we can talk about it next week, if, um, if, uh, if anyone's aware of uh, situations in other communities where you have uh, an overlay for a single parcel. Thanks. Uh, okay, Janet? Or, or Nate, did you want to answer that? Well, I was going to say, um, you know, I, I could look in terms of the parking garage. I feel like I've seen it, but, you know, like a, when we were looking at the 40R district or 43D expedited permitting, those are often property specific and only on one property. So it's an overlay zone, you know, just for a certain type of development. So, you know, when we were looking at 40R as a community, it was a, it was a um, you know, district wide, but in Northampton, they have, you know, a single property designated as a 40R and it can also a single property can also be designated as a local historic district which isn't zoning but you know there are so some of these tools can be on a property without being you know spot zoning or in violation of uh you know mass general law thank you janet so i was going to say but it, um partly in was just that i was sort of excited by the overlay because it seemed like we were looking at one zoning type versus another and we're trying to think about setbacks and consequences and heights and you know footnote a waivers and it seemed like nothing would quite fit or give people certainty in terms of what would be there in terms of not having it too big or whatever um, but maybe we could also use some information next week about these overlay districts and how they're used too you know in addition to the the boundary um the boundary lot too just to give us a little background so we'll feel more comfortable with it or see some examples of it, or there have to be times when it's great and other times when it's not. But I, I like the flexibility of being able to shape that a bit. Great, thank you. All right, we'll go to public comment. Uh, I see Claire first. Pam, you are muted. Okay, 
I'm sorry that I'm muted. Um, I'm, I am seeing something for the very first time. Apparently, Claire is using a different version of Zoom, older version of Zoom. So I'm muted. Can you help me? We can't hear you, Pam. You can't hear me at all? Now I can when you sort of okay. point your head down. OK. So I have to promote Claire to panelists in order to speak because she is running an older version of Zoom than we are on. So bear with me a moment. There she is. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, give us your name and where you live. Yes, hi, thanks. My name is Claire Bertrand. I live at 610 Bay Road, South Amherst. Um, thank you for letting me speak briefly. I would like to speak in favor of this uh, proposal for an overlay. Um, I feel like uh, suitable garage is needed in downtown Amherst um, and any tools that the planning board can um, implement to move that along will suit the many people who visit town. This garage probably wouldn't be built for me or you because we know how to find parking in town. This garage would be built for my out of town family who post pandemic might be able to come back and visit. And when I say, let's go downtown, they won't get lost. I can just tell them where to park at the garage and then we can meet up it makes a lot of sense. It's needed. And I appreciate uh, your thoughtful uh, research. Um, and we certainly don't want to, um, we want to answer all questions. We want to do our research, but we also need to um, really trust the process that is going on and trust that if there's private money that will be put forward, that our support um, in zoning in this town invites investment. That's a good thing. And people like the cinema uh, and the justices deserve uh, town will support them with good zoning. So thank you. Thank you, Claire. I will I will point out that it was it was somewhat difficult to hear you, but I think we heard everything you said. Uh, next next will be uh, Gabrielle Gould. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Right. Hi, Gabrielle Gould as the executive director of the Amherst Business Improvement District, also the downtown Amherst Foundation, also a resident at 34 Canton Avenue and taxpayer in Amherst. Um, one thing I'd like to start with is I want to set the record straight. There was a piece written in the Amherst Indy that had some high lit points in it. Uh, I, I believe it was written by Terry Johnson. Uh, the first thing is that if indeed I said at the library trustees meeting that John Kuhn or Kuhn Riddle had anything to do with any designs for this, that was a mistake on my part if I actually said it. I don't believe I did. I do think there is some confusion over the Drake live performance and music venue that Kuhn Riddle is indeed assisting in designing. Uh, Kuhn Riddle has nothing to do with any designs that have been put forward or designed for this parking garage. The other thing I'd like to say is there is absolutely no under the table dealings or backdoor happenings. The bid has been very transparent. We have attended most of these meetings and spoke publicly in support of this. Nothing nefarious has been done in the background and any plans that we have drawn up were simply simple, 
preliminary plans to find out what something like this could cost the bid, because to put ourselves forward, if an RFP were put out for a PPP, we would be really uh, silly and, and unprepared to come in with something that we had no concept of cost or what that could look like. So there have been plans drawn up. They are very preliminary plans, and they're really just to show us what could be possible on that place. I'd also like to make it clear that Barry Roberts is not building a garage for five, six, seven, eight, nine, or $10 million on any lots in downtown that I know of. What Amherst does need is destination parking. Uh, we all see that when we go to Northampton, we look right in front of where we want to park, and then we move on and go to the parking garage where there are lovely signs that tell us how many parking spaces are left. I'm going to reiterate what Claire said. I now, after two and a half years, know where all the hidden secret spots are, and I love finding them. Nelson Nygaard put five things in place, both in their first and second time, and the town is working on them, and I have been privileged to be chatting with Sean Mangano and work with him on some of those uh, things going forward. I'd like to just reiterate that in, 19, that in the 90s, both Northampton and Amherst were looking at building parking garages. Northampton did indeed build a four-story plus roof structure that has about 430 spaces. Amherst, due to the town meetings, politics, and lawsuits, uh, managed to turn that four-story level garage into two. Uh, there are 196 spaces, 106 spaces above, and 80 below. There are 96 spaces existing. So the net gain of 90 spaces that cost the town $5 million at $55,000 a space. And now we all know that that parking garage is in uh, need of a lot of repair and has mold and water problems. I'd like to also say that the committee looked in the 80s at the parking garage on the CVS spot. And there's been a lot of history there. And Nate Malloy, I'd like to thank you for looking at that as well. If you have not seen them, I'm more than happy to read, but I'm gonna wait and hear if you haven't gotten them from Lori Christensen at Clay's, which is a downtown Amherst business right on Main Street. I'd also like to say that there was a letter written to you from Sean Clearly, Cleary from Amherst Copy, who has moved out of Amherst and made it clear that part of the reason why he decided to relocate his business was because of parking concerns. Uh, there's also a letter to you in your packet from Karen Rhodes from Clay's Donut uh, yeah. and from yeah. Amherst yeah. Books, Shannon Ramsey and Nat Harold. Uh, I think also you'll hear from a lot of business owners and stakeholders in our downtown. This is a constant concern. Yeah, first thing I heard about when I was hired at the bid, and it is the thing that I constantly hear about going forward. Yes? Uh, you've exceeded your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, let's hear from Razif Rafiq. Can you restart? Hi, can you hear me? Now? Yes. Hi, Razif. Hi, my name is Razif Rafiq. I'm a resident of 61A Main Street. It's the building right after the town hall and uh, the owner of Bistro 63 and Monkey Bar in downtown Amherst. Um, first of all, as a resident, um, I've lived in, in town for, uh, uh, I think, 14 years. And uh, I, I think it, it took me a good set, six or seven years to find out how to park, uh, where to park on a busy, uh, uh, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, sometimes uh, on, an eva on a Tuesday evening. Um, as a business that sees about 70 to 75,000 uh, people come in and out of our doors on um, any uh, given year, uh, it's a big complaint of ours uh, from not only large reservations, uh, the private events that we have, but from you know the senior citizens um, that come to a restaurant that don't want to park all the way on uh, Triangle Street to walk uh, over into downtown. Um, from the locals who love coming out over the summertime um, or discover us over the summertime, then stop coming out when they realize what kind of parking uh, is not available uh, during uh, the academic uh, season. Uh, my staff uh, complain always uh, uh, about parking. Um, I, 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 yeah, I just, I, I can't say enough how helpful another uh, parking lot uh, would be in Amherst. I feel like the businesses in Amherst have sort of plateaued um, because we cannot have more people come downtown uh, on a regular basis year round uh, because uh, you know, as we all know, Northampton has better parking. Um, and uh, you know, when someone, uh, a local comes out here uh, for, to a restaurant for the first time in the month of October, uh, this on a weekend like this weekend, parents weekend, and I bet you if they haven't been to town before, they're not going to find parking. They're not going to take all the things into considerations that I know, such as 
there is a thousand parents in town this weekend, so parking is really bad. They're just going to think Amherst is a terrible place to park. Uh, you know, yes, there's restaurants here, uh, uh, some cool places to visit, but there's no parking. So I will not return even in January, even in the summertime when there are no students here. So, you know, I've been a business owner for seven years now. Um, I, I, I love living in town. I love walking to town. But when I have guests, uh, when my uh, restaurant has guests, they, they do not have parking. So it is, it is, a, really, it is a really big issue. Uh, un unfortunately, on my night off, when I go out to eat, um, especially if I do have the luxury to go out on a weekend or even Tuesdays, for some reason, is a really busy night in town. I go to Hadley. I go to Northampton when I go out with a big group of people because I want to be able to park and, and, and walk around and have a good time. And right, Northampton has that option. Uh, Amherst, Amherst does not. And I'd, I'd really love to see some, uh, uh, some headway on this. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Rafiq. Next will be uh, Barry Roberts. Hey, Doug, 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 I, I've had my hand up. Yes, Jack, I, I saw I, your I, hand. I, I could not hear anything that Claire Bertrand said. And I'm wondering if she needs to, you know, restate what, you know, what it was. Cause I didn't, I, it was so choppy. I didn't hear anything. Well, is she still in attendance? I mean, I could hear her, it was sort of elongated. So, but, but I could hear the gist of it. Why don't we get through the people with their hands up and see if Claire at that point wants to try again. I think it was probably some sort of problem with her microphone and I'm not sure whether it's fixable this evening. So we'll help me remember to come back to that. Barry, do you wanna speak? Pam, can you unmute Barry Roberts? There we go. Thank you all. Uh, my name is Barry Roberts. Um, I live at 200 Bay Road in Amherst. I've been a lifelong resident of Amherst. We actually own the property through a trust, the Virility Trust, right in front at 96 North Pleasant. You may uh, know the driveway that goes between CBS and the building to the right where Miss Saigon is. That is my property, that is my driveway and the land immediately behind. I just wanted to bring, um, you know, I've been involved in this discussion about a parking uh, facility at this location for a long, long time. In 1984, town meeting voted to take this property from uh, the Vincent family, the Rob Roberts family through the EV Realty Trust. Uh, they even uh, had included in the original motion uh, the uh, Catholic Diocese, but that was pulled off just before town meeting. So it was four or five parcels right there. And eventually the town voted the money to acquire the Vincent property, which is now the town parking lot. But this, has long been identified as a prime location for parking, easily accessible, uh, short walking distance to the major, major attractions downtown. And as a landlord to quite a few restaurants in the area, I can uh, say that it's very important parking. That's a constant complaint that I get that none, employees can't park and visitors can't find a place. And I say that our competition is the malls, our competition is Northampton. And if we wanna create a vibrant downtown and make it stronger, which I think we're on the way to doing it with a music venue, uh, maybe an outside band shell, I think this is another cog in the wheel that needs to be added. And, and without the town investing their own money, I think it's a really good way to go. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Barry. Next, I see Amy Gates. Please state your name and address. My name is Amy Gates. I'm at 54 Spalding Street in Amherst. 
Um, I'm a resident here and um, I'm really interested in the importance of destination parking in this town because as Barry was just talking about, in order to make it vibrant, we have to, businesses have to know that they can count on parking. And my reps, uh, this was right before COVID, my two reps, I'm in district four, talked about they'd been, there'd been contact and communication with a garage company that was going to pay for the garage in exchange for taking the proceeds from the tickets. So I'm just curious, um, Janet McGowan, where you get this information that Barry Roberts is gonna build a garage for $5 million or, or that it's gonna cost the town a dime. To me, that kind of histrionic misinformation is, is a big problem that happens in this town and divides people and people can't make clear decisions. I, I really want people to get their facts straight on that one. I mean, that's, that's really frustrating to me, I have to say, as a resident of this town. Um, I've talked with Gabrielle Gould in the past and she's stated how she's contacted really wonderful businesses in other towns, neighboring towns, and they've all said, we'd be here in Amherst in a heartbeat if we knew we could count on parking. And to me, that, that, that garage behind CVS is the perfect location. It's sort of tucked away. It's not, an, it wouldn't be an eyesore. It wouldn't be in the middle of obvious downtown. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Amy. Uh, next, let's hear from Anne. Hey, everybody, can you hear me? Yes. I think I was a legacy hand <laughs> before, this, before the debate started. I just wanted to speak to, um, I think it's really important to explore the CVS lot. It makes the most sense, and I should restate that I'm speaking on behalf of I think a 30 year, 35 year business in downtown Amherst, uh, Laughing Dog Bicycles. Um, and we've thought about this parking thing forever and it's important to explore the CVS lot. I think it makes the most sense. It's already a parking lot, people use it. They know where it is, it's centrally located. Um, and that's really important for folks with ability issues. They wanna know that they can park and get to the locations they wanna visit with ease. Um, I think it's easier to work towards putting a garage there because the abutting property owners are locals or have local ties and they're reachable. And I think other spots that are in consideration like the Bank of America lot on Amity Street, it's really hard to reach the Bank of America. So I think working with people that you can talk to is super important. Um, it's a central location, but it's hidden enough and the slope or grade of the law, it makes a tree border on North Prospect Street able to provide a decent screen. So I just wanted to say, I think this is the most logical place to put the garage and that's all I have. Thank you. Can you give me your last name? Yes, Ann Tweedy. Tweedy, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, next we have John Snyder. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, John. Okay, sorry, I was muted. Uh, my name is John Snyder. I am a resident of Amherst at 74 Blue Hills Road, just down the hill from the lot in question. I'm also a member of the um, DAF board. And I also um, work with Laudable Productions who um, will be doing a, a large majority of the programming for the Drake. Um, and I can tell you, that and and I'm not here to, to talk about how incredible the Drake is going to be, but I will say that um, it it has every uh, potential and likelihood of, of becoming a very very significant um, driver for the downtown economy, um, not just in terms of bringing people to the Drake, but actually opening up lots of potential for other businesses to expand because of the. Um, because of the uh, you know incoming to uh, from from all around, we're hoping that the the Drake will actually become a a nationally and potentially internationally recognized venue, and that's not hyperbole. There's very good reason to put money on that, <laughs> and many people are. Um, but to to the point, um, I've already begun the process of reaching out to potential. Um, musicians and their agents to um, scope out their interest in 
coming to the Drake, they and and I will tell you, we are very excited that um, across the board, the answer is yes. People do want to come to expand their audience and um, come to Amherst and to the Drake in particular. However, I will also tell you that many of the agents I've spoken to and the musicians have asked, in addition to what kind of piano are you going to have um, and how many seats are there going to be, um, is what is the parking like? Um, and I can tell you that I've had to kind of um, work around that a little bit. I will just say that the Drake can become one of the most incredible forces um, driving the economy in Amherst, but it will not be able to do that and it won't become the kind of a, a venue we want, meaning one that draws people from far and wide, not just locally people who can walk to the Drake, but people who will come to Amherst just to see music, hear music, um, the facility that we're talking about is, is essential. It, it can't be that without that. So I'm not gonna talk about why I think that location is perfect. Others have already done that, although I will agree with all of them. I think it is the ideal location. Um, and so I'll just leave it there. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, John. Next, we have uh, either Sharon or Mary or both of you. Hi, my name is Sharon Povinelli. I live at 493 Montague Road in Amherst. And I also run AJ Hastings with um, Mary Brawl, who's sitting next to me. Hello. Um, so I'm obviously here in support of uh, the overlay, the overlay idea. Um, everybody's talked about, or a couple people have talked about destination parking. I think that's pretty clear. You, you head to Northampton, you head to the garage. If you find a spot before that, you pull in, but you know um, you're going to get a spot and you're going to be able to walk around and do whatever you want to do in Northampton. That's great. Um, I'd like to also talk about uh, why it's important to um, go ahead with um, thinking about parking, uh, a, a parking facility on this lot and in general in Amherst. Um, Pat D'Angelo said something really striking. I think it was Monday night when we were talking about uh, the performance shell on the common and she was talking about the design. She said, that design challenges me, but in a good way. And I think we, we need to challenge ourselves about what we what we think about Amherst and really um, uh, how we can develop Amherst into an exciting place. And you know, again, we have these we have these programs coming on that are going to want to have people come in town, like the Kendrick uh, Playground. It's great to see people coming into town and using that nice new park. Um, if the, when the Drake gets uh, up and running, that's gonna be another draw. And then the performance shell is gonna be another draw. That's great. Um, I know that the library wants to expand their programming. Um, we need to develop, think about development in Amherst, not as a bad, as a bad word, but development as, as like a child, you, you, you want to help them develop and grow. And one of the things that businesses need is a guaranteed people stream, sort of like when you retire, if you can retire and have a, an income stream, we need a guaranteed people stream and not just at one time of the year, but year round. And parking is a, is a huge way to get that. And I um, would suggest that you humbly accept this idea of an overlay district. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Next, we have Mary Sayer. Please give your name and your address. Hi, Mary, can you unmute yourself? You have the ability to speak. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, well, I just wanted to say, I think it's pretty clear that there's an overwhelming sense in Amherst that we need a, a 
parking garage. And I would certainly agree with that or, or better parking. Um, but I think the discussion tonight is not whether we need a parking garage or not, which is what we seem to have, this talk seems to have come down to, but whether the, it's appropriate to make an overlay district and zoning before we know that a parking lot would really work there. And my concern is um, getting into the garage because I've been over to the garage in Northampton and often there's a line of cars in both directions trying to get into the garage. So I'm just trying to figure out how that Main Street in Amherst is going to accommodate two lines of cars trying to get into a garage while we're doing flow through traffic and possibly the narrowing of the streets because of restaurants being outside. So my feeling is not that I don't want a garage there. It seems in most ways a really wonderful place for it to be, but to change a zoning be and then find out it actually would never work because of the way the entrance works just seems like a backwards way of doing it. And maybe that would be just, just looking at that uh, before making that decision. Um, if you find out, why find out afterwards that the garage isn't going to work and then you've changed zoning for that? Because you're really changing the zoning so we'll have a parking garage. So it seems backwards to say, we're gonna change the zoning and then find out whether a parking garage would work there. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, Sharon, you still have your hand up and I'm gonna assume you no longer need to speak. Uh, and so Sharon, Sherry, you are next. Hey everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. I'm Sharon Sherry. I'm the director of the Jones Library. I'm also a member of the BID Board of Directors. Um, I just wanted to lend my support to the overlay zone for this parcel of land. Um, I think Amherst absolutely needs destination parking. Library patrons are constantly complaining about the lack of parking, having to constantly circle to find a spot. Amherst attracts people from all across the valley. And these are people who don't know about those secret side street parking spots. Uh, these are people who want to spend money uh, in town and they want to they want to visit the town's cultural attractions. Um, and so I really feel that uh, destination parking will make such a difference and the location couldn't be sweeter. You know, parking garages tend to be ugly. Uh, so here is the perfect location uh, hidden. And, um, and because of the overlay, it will limit the number of floors uh, uh, that, that it will go. Uh, so it, it, it will help so many concerns. So I just... Um, Thank you for your time and go planning board. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Sharon, you'll need to mute yourself. I'm hearing an echo. Uh, Claire, I see your hand up. You wanna try once again to give us uh, the short version of your comments. Thank you, yes, I apologize. Can you hear me better now? Yes, this is much okay. better. Excellent, I changed computers. I. I lucky enough to have that ability. Um, so thank you. In brief, I support this proposal um, and I appreciate um, so many people have spoken and I agree with much of what was said. I will uh, remind us that this already is a parking lot. So we're not gonna find out if it works as a parking lot. We actually know it works as parking. What we're going to do is double, triple it, and uh, cars will stream in and out as they do now. Um, I would love to have us um, have double, triple what we have back there. It's a great spot. Um, so that's all I'd like to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Claire. All right. So this evening, we are only being asked to uh, continue this hearing to next week. October 6th, I believe it is. So uh, could I get a motion to uh, do so? Janet, you are muted. Are you making a motion? You are still yes. muted. Um, am I here now? Yes, you are. I'll move to continue this to October 4th. 
Do I need to pick a, I don't need to pick a time, do I, Chris? The fourth is Monday, I believe. Oh, sorry, sorry. I think so. it's the sixth. And six. Well, I will then move to move it to October 6th. Oh, to continue. To and continue it, yes. Andrew, your hand is up. I'll second that, Doug. All right. Uh, Chris, do we need a, a time definite? Yes, you do. And why don't you choose um, 635? I don't think there's anything prior to that. All right. Janet, do you uh, accept that? I will amend my motion to 635 on that date. All right. Uh, any discussion? Uh, all right. Actually, oh, I have Janet. a question. So, so I do not want to spread rumors and misinformation. I actually feel like I have almost no information. So I was hoping that um, obviously I've raised questions. Can we get more information about the deal that's being discussed and the partners? Um, I didn't, I had the impression the town was putting money in. I just don't know anything of what's going on. And I, I guess I can wait to next week. I'd love to hear some this week, but I just, I just feel like I'm in a info desert in terms of this parking garage. I understand people feel the need for it. I just don't know all the details around it or any details really around it. Chris, do you want to respond to that? I think um, we as a group, Nate and Rob and I have not been part of any conversations about um, the town um, participating in this project. If there are such conversations going on, they may be occurring at a higher level than we are. Like the third floor rather than the second floor, but um, I don't know if we were gonna, are going to be able to um, provide that kind of information because um, that is often, uh, if it's related to um, land purchase, land lease, or anything like that, that doesn't usually come into the public eye. Um, um, Chris, so Chris. I can ask um, if there's something that can be shared, but I I, I don't know of anything. Chris, will there not be a public solicitation of proposals to put a parking garage on this site. Of course there would be, yes. So, the so, so, there the isn't, so there is no deal at this no point. No deal, no. Nope. There have been some probably conversations about whether anybody thinks it's feasible, but you know we won't really know a lot of these details until that RFP process results in some proposals for people to see. And that'll be a public process. I assume the proposals would be available, uh, you know, on some part of the town website. Uh, Jack. Yes, um, I see Gabrielle Gould has her hand up as well after me. But I just want to say that that what resonated with me is, you know, for for revitalization of the downtown is that parking certainty. And I just, I think it's such a turnoff for people when they don't know about parking. Um, I thought that was key. And, um, you know, but, you know, and I think the Drake is a great opportunity and, and we don't know the details, but um, I, you know, I hope that we can make this, you know, overlay work is it seems so vital to what we're trying to, you know, accomplish with with downtown, uh, but Gabrielle has her hand up, so I'll, I'll hopefully Thanks, call Thanks. on her. Thanks, Jack. Uh, before I do that, we are in deliberation with a motion on the table. Um, Chris, is it allowed to have public comment during that period? I think so. Okay, thank you. So why don't we let. Gabrielle speak. Uh, can you keep your comments to say a minute and a half this time? I would just like to speak on behalf of the bid. There is no deal. Um, I believe that this is a very many stepped process that starts with you doing a recommendation to the town council, at which point I believe it will take nine of them to vote just to redo the zoning. Then there's the idea and the concept of writing an RFP and what that would look like. And then there's the accepting of bids for that 
uh, public part private partnership. Um, and again, the bid has made it very clear that if there is to be an RFP and if the RFP is something that we see ourselves being capable of applying for and following through on, we would like to be one of the applicants because we see that this is one of the most important economic and destination drivers for our downtown and Amherst wide. So again, there is no deal. There are no offers on the table. There is no lease. There is no anything. What there is, is the change of zoning so that it could be possible for a pre-existing non-conforming lot, which is what it is now, because it is not meant to be a parking lot either, to become a parking garage. And then I believe, and Rob, you will know better than I and Chris, that there are three or four more steps to go through before an RFP can even be put forward. So we're looking at 2024, 2025, which is fantastic, because the hope is that, that this garage gets built after the library is finished, that they're building, and that we complement all of the things that are coming into downtown Amherst. Again, thank you all for your time. Always, I really appreciate all that you do. Thank you, Gabrielle. All right, so let's go back to the board. I see uh, Janet. So next week, will we get any information about the size of a potential structure, how many new spaces, anything like that? Are we just going to, we're, are we getting any more information? I, I, I expect Nate uh, if I can speak for Nate, I ex well, okay, Nate, why don't you just say what you'll expect to show up with? Yeah, no, I, I'd like, you know, the staff is working with the proponents to have something uh, that can be sent in the planning board packet. So it can have, you know, dimensional standards, uh, standards and conditions that can be reviewed. And, you know, what zoning right provides is the minimum or maximum build out. It doesn't actually say how big the structure will be or how many spaces it will be. So you know, I think those specifics and that design is really up to each applicant um, for the facility. So what zoning is doing, as Gabrielle pointed out, is providing a pathway to have a parking facility be developed. Um, you know, I think we could imagine, um, uh, you know, what could be built, you know, what, what is, you know, what is a typical garage look like, but it's really up to someone responding to a request for proposals that the town puts out. So I think trying to assume what the building will look like or how big it is, um, you know, it's not really what the zoning does in terms of what we're going to provide next week. It's really what are the, you know, the standards that could be used. All right. Thank you. Uh, I think, Johanna, I think you were next. Great. Thank you so much. And first of all, I just want to thank the staff for all the work they've put into this. It's always uh, really interesting to see these projects evolve and get refined over time. So just grateful for that. Um, Nate, do you anticipate that next week we would actually be able to see like proposed language for what that overlay, I don't know, district, you know, like what would it like, yeah, would we actually be able to have language to respond to, do you think, or would it be more like kind of broad concepts? No, we think to have language that the board can respond to. So it's not just a conversation about generalities, but just, you know, something specific that uh, can be commented on. Terrific. You, Look forward to seeing that. Thank you. All right. I'll remind the board this is not typically a conversation. So once you finish speaking, please mute yourself and uh, don't speak again until I call on you again. Thank you. Uh, Janet. Could we have drawings of maximum build out, um, kind of three dimensional drawings? Thank you, Janet. Nate? Um, I don't know, I'll talk with staff to see if that, you know, what that would look like. I think, um, you know, like I said, there can be different configurations for parking garages. And so it's hard to assume exactly what, what a response could look like, but we can have some, um, you know, perhaps some concepts. Thank you. Are there any other comments or do we want to go ahead and have a, a end discussion and, and vote for uh, Jack? Jack, did you want to speak? You're on mute. Uh, I'm, uh, I was on mute, sorry. Uh, so I'm just saying um, with regard to this, um, this hearing, um, we're asking for a lot of details that 
I just think it, it's it's unreasonable for us to ask for. I mean, it, we're, we're looking at a concept for an, a super need for downtown where, you know, parking certainty that the town will most definitely benefit from. And, you know, to ask for details is just unreasonable at this point, you know, in time. And, and those will come along if something happens, but we know that there is a super need for parking, especially if we're going to this entertainment, you know, sort of, you know, district with the Drake proposal, which is, you know, awesome for the downtown. So um, just want to put the brakes on, on details on this, on this, you know, garage. I mean, it, it just, it seems, you know, way, uh, you know, ahead of the curve there. So that's all. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and at, at the point that we have a proposal from Nate and the staff to vote on for recommendation to town council, each of us will have to just decide whether there's been adequate detail uh, for us to vote in favor of it. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, I agree that uh, specifics for the actual property itself, um, we'll figure that out down the road. I do think though that um, we probably could have some conversation around the traffic impact because um, there, there would be, and by that, I don't mean like traffic counts per se, but just, I think it's, I think it would be reasonable for us to consider that um, you know, the, the likely access point is off of a one-way road um, and it's a residential road. So I, I do think that it, that whether it's, you know, a garage for 50 spaces or 200 or 300, if we're directing people through that, I think that it, that would be something worth talking about next week. Thanks. Thank you. All right. I don't see any more hands raised. So uh, we have a motion, we have a second. Uh, can we go ahead and vote? All right, so the motion is, let's see, Pam, would you be able to read the motion again? Good. Was that a, a no? Oh, no, it's yes, I'm flipping my paper. Oh, good. So, just so we get it right here. It will help if I flip to the right page. I believe we were going to continue the hearing to October 6th at 635. That that is correct. Ms. McGowan made that motion to move um, to continue the public hearing to Wednesday, October 6th at 6:35 p.m. And Mr. McDougal seconded. All right, thank you. So why don't we go through and vote? Uh, we'll go uh, one at a time. Uh, Maria? Yes. Jack? Yes. Tom? Yes. Andrew? Aye. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And I'm an I, so it is unanimous to continue the hearing. All right. Uh, why don't we go ahead on to the next item on the agenda, which is another continuation. This is, um, continue, this is the public hearing for SUB 2022-01 for 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street from Archipelago Investments, LLC, a request uh, of approval for a two lot preliminary subdivision plan under MGL chapter 41, sections 81L and 81S with a variety of maps. I'm not gonna read all of them. So uh, Chris, do you wanna say anything about this to introduce it? Yes, um, we spoke about this earlier this year. I think um, the public hearing was opened on August 25th, and then it came back um, one one other time, I believe, or no, it didn't come back. It, it was um, on August 25th, 
Actually, I can't quite remember. (laughs) But anyway, it was opened on August 25th. Um, And then I think it was September 1st when the board um, continued the public hearing to September 29th. Not exactly sure about that date. But anyway, um, the applicant is again coming back and asking to have the public hearing continued to October 20th. Um, which is a regular board meeting. And so um, that is the request that's before you tonight. All right. Uh, So do we have any comments or questions from the panelists, from the board? Andrew. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's any uh, stated reason why they would want to uh, push this back. Thanks. Chris. I have not heard a stated reason. Okay. Um, Chris, is there any, there's no particular timeline on which this has to happen. It could just be continued on and on and on if we all want to do that. Is that true? Well, what you'd be um, agreeing to is further extending the 45 day review period. You already, did agree to extend the 45 day review period to September 29th. And now you'd be agreeing to extending the 45 day review period to to October 20th. So there is a time limit, it's a statutory time limit, but the planning board can agree to extending that time limit with the request of the applicant. So that's, that's what you did last time. And that's what is being requested this time. Okay. Um, I see Andrew. I'll make a motion to extend that timeline. Thank you. Uh, I'm seeing Janet's hand. Do uh, you want to second, second Janet? Yeah, oh. second. Great, thank you. No further board hands up, and I don't see any hands up among the attendees. I have I have a hand up, Mr. Marshall. Okay. So I just I just want to be clear. Are we going to extend it to October twentieth? And Chris, do we need a a time, a certain time? We do need a time. Six thirty-five. All right. So Andrew, uh, you all right with us amending your your with amending your motion to? I was trying to keep it official. Yes, I'm perfectly fine with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, not seeing any further hands. Let's go through and vote. Maria. Yes. Jack. Aye. Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. And Johanna? Aye. And I'm an I as well. It's unanimous. Thank you. Um, so we're almost at eight, we're almost at eight o'clock. I'm wondering if this would be a good time for people to take a break. Um, why don't we, I see 7.54 on the uh, clock. And why don't we take a break until eight o'clock? So Pam, could you put up the, uh, we're, we're, we're on break? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So please mute yourself and turn off your video until you return.
All right, I'm seeing eight o'clock. Folks who are back, if you could turn your video back on. There's Janet. You know, I keep thinking of Romper Room. You ever see, remember that show? I, I see you and I see you and I see you. <laughs> I'm gonna have a hard time getting that that, memory out of my head that takes me back like to yeah, pre-memory yeah, that, that was an early early memory for me i can just say as someone who just had a birthday i'm so glad i didn't get that reference to make me feel a bit younger <laughs> well it might have been a, it might have been a regional thing too andrew are you, is that like a, is that, Doug, are you from like the New York metro area? No, I'm from the Midwest. Oh, no. I'm aware of the show. I just, I didn't know I think know it was happened. national. I think it was a national hit for, okay. and it'd be funny to see that now. Doug, right. I forget, where, where are you from? The I'm Midwest? From St. Louis. Oh my gosh, you're, you're like a stone's throw from uh, my my hometown yeah. in, in central Illinois. I think we talked about that. <laughs> All right, and we can talk about it more later. Uh, looks like we've got everybody back. Johanna? So, what's that? Johanna back? Uh, oh, you're right. She has not turned on her video. Thank She's you, Janet. Done. Well, I do have a preamble for this public hearing, and I'm wondering whether I should start that. Here she is. I see the video. All right, so we're all back together. All right, the next item on our agenda. In accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this is a public hearing and I, I guess I'll just say this is a public hearing for SPP 2022-01 Center East LLC at 446 Main Street. So this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPP 2022-01 Center East Street LLC at 446 Main Street. It's a request of a special permit to amend previous special permits, ZBA FY79-57, ZBA FY83-25, ZBA FY92-70, and or 95-27, to allow a change in the site plan to accommodate a driveway connection between 446 Main Street and 462 Main Street. Map 14B, parcel 66 in the BN zoning district. All right, are there any board disclosures for this hearing? I don't see any. Uh, Chris, do we have an applicant who wishes to present tonight? We have Mr. John Robleski. Um, I just wanted to make a brief statement beforehand to explain that uh, Mr. Robleski's property used to be in the RG zoning district, and the previous owners wanted to operate a uh, mixed use building, and so they had to get a series of special permits in order to do that. Um, Mr. Robleski has plans for this property at 446 Main Street, future plans, but he's um, those plans have not really been gelled yet. And so um, in the interim, he would like to be able to um, connect his property with the adjacent property, which he also owns. So um, Rob Mora suggested that rather than go through the whole site plan review process, that um, Mr. Robleski take this to the planning board as an amendment to 
all of those special permits which were granted by the Zoning Board of Appeals when this property was under different zoning. And so that's what is um, coming before you tonight. So you'll be, um, if you agree to, amending these special permits to allow uh, that connection to occur. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Mr. Rob Robleski. Uh, you are muted. There you go. Yeah, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, thank you. All right, yep. Thanks for your time again. Uh, yeah, a little background, I guess. During the course of finishing the project at 462 Main Street, which is directly to the east of this property, um, the opportunity to purchase 446 came up at the end of May, and we did purchase it at the end of June. Um, so over the summer and looking at different things and kind of thinking ahead a little bit, it kind of made sense to me to have a drive-through ability from Main Street all the way out to Gray Street, um, primarily for easier access and egress and exit and public safety response. Uh, the trash truck right now has to back in to empty the trash recycling. So this would allow it to drive in and do its thing and then drive out to Gray Street or vice versa. So it just kind of made sense to me to do this connection. It's only a piece of land that's about 22 feet long from curb to curb from one lot to the other. And it just seems to make a lot of sense. I spoke with Jason Skeels or sent him the uh, diagram about it and Mike Roy from the fire department and they have no issues with it. Um, Mike Roy seemed to think it made a lot of sense again from the public safety standpoint. Um, so that's the gist of it. It's basically just making that drive through access from one property to the other. So there's basically two entrances and two exits, one right, up to, right out to Gray Street and one out to Main Street. All right, thank you. I think in an earlier package, we may have had a site plan of this. There yes. is a site plan. If Pam can bring it up. Uh, yeah, would it, we, why don't we bring that up at least Briefly. I buy it. There we go. And was there another page with the actual sort of connection shown? Maybe not. Yes, there is. Yes. Right there. There we go. All right. So um, looks like Chris Brestrup is the only hand up. I wanted to, if you're recognizing me, I wanted to yep. suggest that you ask Mr. Robleski to describe um, the parking situation, um, both uh, how this um, new drive will affect parking on um, the place where the new building just was built at 4 462 Main Street, as well as how it will affect parking at 446 Main Street, because it does have some effect, but it doesn't, um, I, I, personally, I don't think it, um, has has an impact. So maybe you want to hear him talk about that. Thanks, Chris. John? Sure. Yeah, so the building that was just finished and occupied as of August 15th on 24 residential units, um, that parking area has 32 parking spaces as approved by, by you folks last year. Uh, that did include about seven spaces that was going to be like shared spaces for the business uses. Uh, one of the businesses being in a new building, and then there was three office areas proposed in the existing building that is now scheduled to be uh, removed. The impact here, well, first off, 
just so everybody knows from the 24 residential units that were occupied and are occupied now, there's only 16 vehicles uh, associated with all those units. So we have about half the parking spaces available that are being used. The property next door that I just purchased the end of June has business on the first floor per the special permits that you're reviewing tonight or amending and one three bedroom apartment on the second floor. So when we take the, the parking bylaw or parking regulations, you need two spaces for the upstairs apartment and then the downstairs business area is like three and a half spaces. I think that's right. Anyways, for a total of eight spaces, uh, or five and a half spaces, I'm sorry, for the business, based on a thousand square feet divided by 303 or the total square footage of the office area divided by 303 is the uh, regulation. So a total of eight spaces is what's required there. The current parking lot there has 14 spaces plus another two in the hash marked areas that really doesn't delineate a handicapped area, but I'm assuming that when they put in the offices, the doctor's offices or what it was in the 70s and early 80s, that that area was supposed to be two handicapped spaces. So really we're gonna have more parking than, than we need or is required on the, the new property and the existing new building. Um, there's only 16 vehicles there. I think it'll work quite well for, for everybody. Thank you. Chris, I see your hand again. So I went, wanted to just mention that um, two parking spaces on the uh, 462 uh, Main Street property would be um, given over to this little driveway and two parking spaces on the uh, four. 46 Main Street property would be given over. Um, the net result is that there is still enough parking for both properties, but I wanted to point that out. And I also wanted to suggest that Pam could scroll down further and get um, an image of the two lots together showing the parking um, situation side by side. So this um, plan shows how the two lots uh, interact with one another, and also the fact that um, Mr. Robaleski described today at the site visit that Janet and I uh, attended, uh, and Jack was there also, that the um, parking or the slope of the driveway would be nine and a half percent, which is within the tolerances allowed by the zoning bylaw. So um, this image here will help you to understand what the interaction of the two lots is. Thanks, Chris. Um, do you, do you or Janet or Jack want to do a site visit report? Janet, I see your hand up. Would you like to do it? Uh, sure. I, I was, I had, a, I had some questions for Chris, but I'll jump in. So, um, the, if you look at the map, it says ride chair parking, and there is a marked out space there. And that was sort of, sort of for, you know, Uber picks up, pick up or drop off. And then Mr. Roblaski thought that was convenient if the, you know, someone pulled into that at 462, dropped somebody off or picked them up, they could just go forward and go into the parking lot at 466 and exit um, on Main Street or actually no, Gray Street. So um, there are two spaces that will be lost. Um, they weren't marked out physically, but you can kind of see them as a dotted line. The slope is, you know, a little bit steep, but not dramatically so. Um, and you know that's that's really the gist of it. Um, there's not that much to say about it. It does go into this parking lot here, and you could see how there'd be good circulation for a fire truck. Like the fire trucks can come to both buildings, but now they can actually exit without backing up or kind of turning around and things like that. So that made sense. And I hadn't thought about the garbage trucks, but that does make sense too. Um, I did wonder. We did ask about the future plans for it, and. Um, those aren't specified, but uh, I think Mr. Um, Roblowski is looking for future housing there. Um, but that, that shouldn't impact here. Um, that Chris, is there anything else that I missed? I'm trying to, there's two spaces lost on each side. And so it's still within the eight spaces required by 466, um, but you're dropping down to 
that was in the, the management plan for 462. And, and does the fact that the, the house that had the businesses in it, you know, once that goes away, that would reduce the parking demand at 462, right? Well, I think we talked about that in initial, like when, when this came in front of the planning board, the idea was the offices were used during the day and that the residents of the um, uh, mixed use building would be primarily parking at night. So it was kind of shared parking because they were showing up at different hours of the day. So um, that wasn't in, the, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's sort of overlapping. I mean, it does seem logical that, you know, if, if you only need seven spaces during the day um, and now you have nothing there. So it, you know what I mean? It's, it doesn't affect the day parking. Um, it could affect the evening parking in the future. Great. So, so that's the end of your site visit report and yeah. you had a question. So I actually had two questions. One is um, for Chris. So is it normal to amend a special permit by SPR? Is, which is what we're doing now for 46. Like, I don't, would you go back to the ZBA and do this or how did we get here? That's my first question. You want me to answer? Yes, please. So you're actually considering a special permit. Um, if you look on the application form that was in your packet, it's SPP. And then in the upper right-hand corner, it says special permit. So since this um, use is now under planning board jurisdiction as a mixed use building, both lots are planning board jurisdiction as mixed use buildings in the current zoning. Um, Mr. Mora thought it would be appropriate for the planning board to issue the special permit to amend the previous ZBA special permits rather than having Mr. Robleski go back to the ZBA when the ZBA doesn't really have jurisdiction over these two properties anymore uh, for this type of use. Okay, that's my first question. And then my second question, which just occurred to me when you were talking before, was would Mr. Robleski need to come back on the permit for 462 and ask for an amendment to lose those two spaces? Chris? Yes, yeah, so I believe he will, um, but he already has um, a plan to come back to you um, once he figures out what he's going to do with that space that's um, going to be empty when the uh, building goes away. Um, and I think he's also planning to replace the little building that now, you know, he's made a little renovation to the little building. It's got some post office boxes and some storage in it, but I think he's planning to replace that little building with something else. So he's going to be coming back to you for 462 anyway. And in my opinion, he could roll in that change um, to the parking lot. In other words, taking away those two spaces and having the driveway, he could roll that into a site plan review for 462 Main Street. Okay. All right, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Janet. Uh, Jack. Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, when we were there, it was, you know, obvious that everything you know, with regard to the new development there at um, the adjacent property that it was functioning properly. Uh, lots of tenants, they were going, you know, to the, uh, to the trash, re you know, recycling situation there. So, you know, everything seemed to be in order. I, I, and I just thought that the, I just want to say that I thought the building looked fantastic and, um, so John, you know, you know, did a good job with regard to that, you know, existing building, but, um, that was going on. So I just thought it would, it would be worth, uh, you know, pointing out, uh, to the planning board. Thank you, Jack. I don't see any more hands raised from the board. Oh, John, do you want to respond to one of these comments? Yeah, just, um, you know, when the folks were there today, they saw it was pretty busy because the uh, high end PV squared photovoltaic, whatever their proper name is, were putting up the solar panels on a roof. So they had their equipment there. Um, there was about 10 spaces that were blocked off and yet the tenants were still able to come and go. Delivery trucks were able to come and go. Um, so it's been functioning pretty well. And, and thank you, Jack, for the 
comment. Um, I, I am pretty proud of the way it came out and the tenants are quite happy and really like their unit. So it's working out. Thanks, John. Um, no other hands raised in either panelists or attendees. So maybe uh, can we have a, a vote to uh, close the hearing and, and approve the special permit? Or does anybody want to do anything else? I'm seeing Jack's hand. Why don't you speak? Uh, so moved for the closure and acceptance. Well, I don't see any public comment at all. So okay. Okay, Jack. So you've you've made a motion to close the hearing and and combined with a second motion to approve the special permit. Do I have a second? I'm seeing Tom's hand, Tom Warren. Okay. All right. All right, why don't we just, why don't we, do, Chris, do we need to have two votes, one to close the hearing and one to approve the permit? You can do it both together. I think you should um, make some reference to whether you think this uh, meets the criteria of section 10.38, which you've been through before, I believe. Um, those are the criteria that, um, are used to judge whether a special permit is uh, adequate or, you know, is suitable. And I think for those of you who have been through it, um, you could say that, yes, this does meet those criteria. Many of them, many of which are not relevant. All right, so Jack, we would amend your motion to uh, close the public hearing uh decree that the change or that this special permit would would comply with 10.38 and approve the special permit i i agree so moved okay all right tom's seconding again good so uh let's go through the the roll Starting with Maria. Uh, Jack. Aye. Tom. Aye. Andrew. Yes. Janet. Approve. What did he say? Johanna. Aye. And I'm an I. It's unanimous. Tom, your hand is up. Do you want to say anything else? Or that was your second. Okay. Legacy hand, sorry. Okay. All right. So thank you, John. And uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Thank you to all the board members. Appreciate your time. And again, I know what it takes to, uh, to be on these boards and spend a lot of time looking at different things, even when you're not on camera. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening and weekend. Thank you, you too. All right. Moving along to the next thing on the agenda, we have old business. Uh, SPR 2021-01 with the Survival Center at 138 Sunderland Road. Discussion regarding the future of the shed as outlined in condition one of our site plan review decision from last year, I believe. Uh, Chris, do you want to speak to this? I just wanted to say that we have um, Sam and um, Lev um, from the Survival Center to make their presentation. And this is um, in regards to a condition of their permit, which required them to come back to tell you about what their future plans for the shed were. And um, they did try to come back um, earlier this season. They tried on, think, I think it was the first meeting in September, but that agenda was very full. So they were um, gracious enough to put off their meeting with you until now. And um, so they're going to explain 
whether they need to keep the shed and if so, why? All right, so I see Lev in the participant in the panelists uh, area. So Lev, do you want to start or should Sam? I'm happy to start, thank you. Um, well, thanks so much for having us back. I um, appreciate this opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, I am Lev Benezra, I'm the executive director of the Amherst Survival Center, um, and I'm here with Sam Guerin, our operations coordinator. So as you recall, and was just outlined uh, last summer, we filed a request for site plan review to uh, review to erect a temporary shelter, a shed um, in the parking lot of the Amherst Survival Center to replace a tent that we had been using uh, with a more weather resistant structure to allow for continued emergency food provision outside through the COVID pandemic. And on September 2nd of 2020, the planning board provided approval um, as Ms. Brestrup just outlining, indicating that we should return to the planning board within a year um, to uh, discuss the future and that the shed was, we were given approval to have it for 18 months. So up through March 2nd, 2022, uh, and that we would be talking at this time about our needs moving forward. Uh, so before I discuss our future needs, I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for that consideration and share a couple of the anecdotes from the very first day that the shed was finally installed and in use. It was really sweet to hear just exclamations from folks who were waiting in line to get lunch, to get produce about how beautiful it is, um, what a nicer place it was to come and get my food a volunteer had shared that it just felt so much more dignified to distribute food from this beautiful shed as opposed to off of pallets or crates um, on the parking lot. And the one that was the most heartbreaking to me was a daily regular uh, came up to me after going through the line and confessed that she was so glad to see this, that she knew that the tent that we had couldn't withstand the winter and that she was had been worried that we would stop providing lunch once the snow came because the tent wouldn't be able to handle it. Um, and of course, that was never our plan or something in consideration. Um, but what it really made clear was that the shed became a critical part of our infrastructure, both very literally allowing us uh, to conduct that essential part of our business, which is a part of us serving well over a million meals prepared in groceries to more than 7,000 of our neighbors over the last year. But then it also provided a really powerful signal to our community that we were here, that we were weathering the storm, so to speak, and that we would continue to be a resource. So I really appreciate the planning board's role in making that possible. So at this time, um, Sam and I are appearing before you here to respectfully request an extension to our permit through the end of calendar year 2022, so December of 2022. Given the ongoing concern that is caused by COVID-19 and specifically the Delta variant um, and continued uncertainty about what the immediate future uh, provides, we are continuing to provide to-go lunches and our fresh produce distribution outside from the shed. It is working really well, and we have now done this successfully through all four seasons, through the highest peaks of our participant volume, um, through all weather, um, and having moved really fully back into our mode of operations that relies so heavily on volunteers. We have reopened our indoors, in-person, full choice shopping for our food pantry that people come to on a monthly basis. And we have also opened an indoor warming center for individuals experiencing homelessness. But we do not yet know when it will be feasible to return to indoor dining. Obviously indoor dining in our setting would be lots of people very close together. Um, there should be no way to ascertain vaccination status or restrict that for those participants um, and folks, including a high number of people who are dealing with serious health issues and the elderly that are all at higher risk. So, um, so we, and additionally, we're also using the area of our building that had been previously dedicated to fresh food distribution 
to help us provide a larger and safer pantry shopping space, which is facilitating the increased distribution of food. We're now giving families uh, roughly twice the amount of food that they were able to access from the food pantry versus before COVID-19. So unfortunately, it really isn't possible for us to determine right now whether or not the shed would prove useful uh, past 2022. And we would respectfully request the opportunity to return to the planning board to discuss the future if that need became clear or seemed like it would be useful. But at this time, within our current mode of operations, what we know is that the shed is working incredibly well. We have sufficient parking, our pedestrian traffic flow is functioning well. Um, the space has really served or suited our needs beautifully, both in terms of COVID safety and in terms of food distribution. And there are many participants who are, have just spoken really highly about that setup and the ability to come and the ease of access that it offers. It blends beautifully with the current building. It really matches the building quite well. I think it looks lovely the street and it has stood up to the weather beautifully. And as I mentioned before, I think just really conveys to our community members that we're here and that these services aren't going anywhere. Um, so just to wrap up, given these ongoing COVID concerns and the iterative and effective adaptations to our programs thus far, we would like to be assured that we may continue to use the session through December of 2022 um, if the need persists. Thank you. So do we have any board questions? Maria. Thanks for that lab. That was really uh, nice to hear that it was working well. And um, I remember the site visit, I can't remember when, but I remember being there and just uh, you guys were just sort of bursting at the seams. And so I feel like during this, you know, time we're in that being flexible and using the spaces you have in different ways makes all the sense in the world. Um, and uh, if it's, I, I'm sorry I didn't go to the site visit, but if it's in fine condition, I have no problem extending to next December. And um, yeah, just really appreciate everything you guys are doing and um, how necessary you are in our town. And so, um, yeah, it seems like it, it's been working and um, I, I just, yeah, I'm so thankful for that, especially now well, so many people need it. Um, and uh, yeah, I would just ask that you treat that building like, you know, another structure that's, um, you know, needs maintenance and care. And it sounds like you are doing that. So, um, so yeah, that, that's my comment. Not really a question. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Any other board comments or questions? Uh, Janet, yeah, I think um, Janet I just... got, got there first, maybe. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to thank Lev and, and Sam and the Survival Center for your work. And I'm, I'm sorry that we have to keep on extending this. Like I hoped 18 months would be enough, but I see the need because um, the, the future is so uncertain. But I do appreciate how you've stretched and accommodated, increased what you've done for the community. So thanks, Janet. And Andrew. I'm just going to pile on for five seconds. Thank you for all you've done. And it makes total sense. I'm very supportive of, of this. Okay. Uh, no other board hands. I don't see any raised hands among uh, the public. Uh, any final comments before we get a motion? All right. So, uh, Chris, uh, do we need to have a, are we amending the uh, SBR 2021? Uh, you are muted. No, you're not amending it. You're just um, responding to the condition. I think it's condition, what number condition is it, one? Um, you're responding to the, to the condition that the applicant shall return and the shed shall be removed within 18 months unless the applicant tells the board that it's still needed. Um, so the applicant has told the board that it's still needed. So if you vote to 
agree with that and to agree that um, they can have the shed there until December of 2022, what we would do is write a letter to them um, stating that that was the vote of the board in response to that condition. And then um, they would be good until December of 2022. Okay, thank you. So can we have a motion to that we, uh, we, we agree that the shed is still needed and we agree to, to allow it to stay in place through December of 2022. Andrew. I will make that motion. Jack. Second. All right. I don't see any hands for any further discussion. So we'll go through the vote again. Okay, I have a quick question, it's Johanna. Yes, Johanna. Sorry. Um, if, as this motion is written right now, if, let, hypothetically, let's say there's another variant and in December of 2022, this like leadership at the Survival Center deems that the shed is still in good shape and filling an important role, would they then have to like, repropose it or would we have a similar process where they like come to us and we consider an extension what would that look like uh chris do you want to answer that i i haven't really thought about this but you could put in a provision in that motion to allow them to come back sometime in the fall of 2022 to talk to you about um future plans for the shed and at that time decide whether you wanted to extend their um, ability to keep the shed and keep using it um, so, um, so, so we need a new uh, extension clause. We can't just rely on the original one. Is that true? I think that's true. So okay. how could we say that? Um, that the shed shall be removed in December of 2022 um, unless, um, unless the, the applicant, applicant tells returns. the board that it's still needed. Okay. Jack? E yeah, I'm, I'm just... I would I would recommend that we extend this as long as we you know is reasonable. Yeah. Well, I yeah I have yeah. a little concern with with a with a deadline in the middle of winter. Um, you know I think our original one was March and that seemed to make sense to me to get through the winter and then, um, you know as spring comes, we can reevaluate. So, uh, what if we made it March of twenty twenty three? I see a thumbs yeah. up from Jack. Uh, we like your all appreciated from our end. Thank you for that consideration. Uh, Andrew, I think you made the original motion. You're I, I did. That? Yeah, I did. I'm, I'm totally fine amending it. I, I, I feel bad asking you to come back because I don't see any circumstance where we would ever uh, <laughs> not uh, recommend renewing. But yeah, can we please make the amendment per Jack's request? <laughs> All right, so we agree that the shed is needed. We would uh, allow the applicant to have the shed in place through March of 2023. And uh, if they want to extend, extend it beyond that date, they would need to return again to the board. Uh, Chris and Pam, does that motion seem reasonably clear? Yes. Okay, let's go through the roll call again, going from the, going reverse alphabetical. Johanna. <laughs> Hi. Hi, okay. Jo You're getting Johanna. tricky, Doug. My God. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Andrew. Hi. Tom. Hi. Jack. Hi. And Maria. Yes, approved. And I am an I as well. All right. Great. Well, thank you right. so much. I um, really appreciate your support. Um, it is it has certainly been quite a year and a half, and um, we're really appreciative of all of the many supporters in the community that have made this collective effort possible and are here and available for any community member for whom free meals or free groceries would, would be a welcome addition at this challenging time. So. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, and we'll we hope we don't have to see you in 2022 or 2023, <laughs> but we'll we probably will. <laughs> sounds like a good. It sounds like a good hope. Thank you so much, and have a good rest of your evening. You too. All right. So moving on to a second item of old business. SPR 2013-00010, Unitarian Universalist Society of Amherst, 121 North Pleasant Street. Discussion regarding the condenser unit screening as outlined in condition number one of the site plan review decision. Uh, let's see, I see Maria's hand. Are you introducing this? Oh, there's Chris. Um, we so have sorry. Suzanne. Oh, sorry, Maria. Can I ask uh, who seconded the last motion? Jack. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Yes. Okay, we Chris, why don't you introduce the UU fence? We have Suzanne Personette, um, who's going to speak about the fence. Um, back in 2013, the university, uni Unitarian Universalist Society went through a um, process with the planning board and they received site plan review approval to expand their building and do various um, site improvements. And they did those and they uh, had a plan to um, put some mechanical equipment on the north side of their building and they were going to um, screen as, as a requirement of the uh, the site plan review approval, they were required to screen the mechanical equipment and they came back to the planning board and they showed what they were going to do to screen it. And they installed the fence as it was approved by the planning board. But since then, um, what they installed was, I believe it was a four foot high um, vinyl fence mm -hmm. that um, was not uh, connected to the building. So people could hop the fence and they could walk around it and, um, there were problems with activities that were occurring behind the fence. So um, now the Unitarians are coming in to ask uh, the planning board if under that same condition, um, they can show you a new type of fence that they would like to install that has a locking gate and connects to the building. And I think it's six feet tall. So um, Ms. Personette is here to talk to you about that. And um, there she is. Thanks, Chris. You did a really good job of explaining it. Um, it's pretty simple. I believe you should all have the, the documents that we submitted because I don't have a presentation tonight. So um, is that a right yeah. Yeah. assumption? Yeah. 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 can bring up the images. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, we removed this, um, the fence that Chris mentioned. Um, th so this is the site plan. Um, uh, see, this is the original document Way back 2013. This um, person that doesn't need to share her screen because we have it in the packet and Pam is trying to access it among all the other material. Thank you. Um, well, she's trying to find it. I um, will just mention we removed the vinyl fence, the four foot vinyl fence, which was only in small sections. Here we go. Um, and so this is a photograph of after we removed the fence. You can see the posts that are still there and the condenser units that are behind it. Um, this was while the um, Craig's Doors was using the facility. And uh, you can see that they have some USA uh, garbage bins and a porta potty uh, located uh, toward on, on our property at the edge of the sidewalk and some garbage bins as well. Those are all gone at this point. Uh, and this is a panoramic view of the garbage bins. Um, so um, what we found is that, um, you know, this is not the kind of equipment that one usually wants to put on a sidewalk um, <laughs> because it's, it's delicate, it's easily vandalized. Uh, in fact, somebody has um, turned off our solar system because the main breaker is out there. Um, and um, so we would like to put in this kind of a fence, which is in keeping with the historic nature of the building and the neighborhood. And, uh, but it's six feet tall, as Chris mentioned. 
it will be um, going from one end of the building to the other, and there will be a lockable gate. This, um, this next plan, the dark line is a blow up of the next drawing, which shows the actual um, line of the, the fence that goes just behind the transformer. Um, and we were asked by the electrical inspector to uh, maintain a three foot clearance between the condensers and the fence. So that's noted on this drawing right now, it's a little bit less than that. The code was probably a little different back then. So um, it's pretty simple. I consulted with um, Kuhn Riddle, who were the architects for the building to, um, and it was their suggestion for, for this fence. And I'm an architect as well. And um, I thought it was you know, quite appropriate for this location. So we have Hasty Fence set up to install it sometime this month or next month. All right, thank you, Suzanne. Mm -hmm. I see uh, two hands on the board. Sure. Let's start, start with Tom. So I think it was last week, Suzanne, where you presented to the design review board. Um, it was. Mm -hmm. and, and it was looked at um, and um, unanimous, unanimously approved for its aesthetics and um, its function within the purposes that um, Suzanne is, is asking for. So I just wanted to put that in there for context. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Andrew? Thanks, Doug. Uh, thanks, Suzanne. Um, I guess maybe just a point of clarity. So is the purpose of this fence for privacy or security? It's for security. Okay. Um, we, uh, it, the previous fence was unintentionally providing privacy um, for people to do things behind the fence that were not okay. Um, and so we felt that this, the, the sort of transparency of this fence, um, but its height would also, you know, discourage people from hopping over. I mean, you really can't hop over the fence at six feet tall, but um, it would keep people from, from uh, hanging out back there. Okay, thanks. Uh, Suzanne, wasn't there a, an intentional screening function of the previous fence uh, to, to not see the equipment? There was, and, and, and this is, is sort of a, it's kind of a compromise between a full screen and accomplishing the goals of both um, security and protection of the equipment um, and, and screening the equipment. So um, we, we thought that it would be an acceptable, we were hoping it would be an acceptable compromise. Um, the full screen actually provides uh, a place for people to hang out and people right. to sleep and do other things. So it's a balance of several different needs. Okay. Andrew? Yeah, you sort of were um, channeling my thoughts there, Doug. If it's a six foot vinyl privacy that attaches to the building, mm -hmm. would that also serve the function of the security as well? If it's, what was the issue? that it was four feet or was the issue that it was not connected to the building? It was both. And um, it, was, um, it was also the, 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 the vinyl fence provided a fully um, opaque screen for people to um, hide behind. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. But I guess would a six foot vinyl fence that attaches to the building provide the same security because you'd still have to jump a six foot fence while also providing the privacy. Um, I, I think it would provide greater privacy. I think we, I think my sense is that it would be, I think that this is a, it's a screen wall. It's not a completely opaque wall. Um, so um, my sense is that a six foot tall fence would be, would encourage, that was a fully opaque that you couldn't see behind would really encourage people to, to go behind it, to climb over it. So, but that's an architectural opinion. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I mean, I first thought that seemed like that would be the logical solution to me personally would, would be that, but um, I'm not aware of the yeah, obviously the security concerns if if you think that people will jump the fence a six foot vinyl fence but obviously this is not one i would certainly want to jump um then 
that's useful information to know. Mm -hmm. uh, Maria? I think that, um, I think usually when we ask for screening from mechanical equipment, it's um, partially visual, but a lot of it's sound. Um, this, I guess, is on the side of the property, so it's you know, not on the front, correct? Um, right, it's on Kellogg Street. Okay, so I'm just wondering. Yeah, I don't think sound was ever part of the original special permit. Um, the site okay, plan. So the equipment isn't like uh, noisy. Uh, not particularly, more, no. More just a visual sort of barrier. Yeah, the only neighbors are the back side of the post office across the street. Ah, okay. um, and there's a, a another screen fence right across the street there that is a chain link fence that has black slats um, woven through it. Um, we so, sort of thought we'd do something a little bit nicer than that. Yeah, no, I mean, visually it looks nice. And so I think that's pretty well solved. And you were able to, you know, make sure no one's doing anything, uh, uh, you know, behind an opaque wall. And so my only question was just the sound issue. And if that's not an issue, then that's fine. Not that I'm aware of. We haven't had any complaints or any problems since 2013. Well, can I ask one more question? What is your last name? <laughs> my last name is Personette. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you spell that, Suzanne? Sure, it's P-E-R-S-O-N-E-T-T-E, -E -T -T -E, and I am a member of the Meeting House Committee of the Unitarian Society. That's the- Thanks, Suzanne. Why I'm here. So, uh, Chris, or I guess I'm not seeing any more hands among the board and I'm not seeing any hands among the public. So uh, what kind of motion do we need to have for this, Chris? You need to have a motion. I'm looking for the um, site plan review decision hmm. that um, meets the requirements of the condition that talks about the fence. I'm not seeing my copy of the um, site plan review. Maybe Pam can bring that up. Yeah, she, yeah she had it. Oh. Sorry, I just stopped the screen share. Hold on. I think you'd want to make a reference to the... Um, you want the number, Chris? Is, the, the condition number, yeah. It's uh, SPR 2013-00010 slash M as in mother 17206. There you go. So there's a condition number one, a plan for screening of the condensers on the north side shall yeah. be submitted to the board for review and approval. So that's what this would be. Yeah. So you would make a motion that what is being proposed here uh, satisfies that um, condition and that you approve what they're proposing. Okay, do we have a motion from anybody on the board? I'm seeing two hands. Andrew, how about you? I wasn't going to, I was gonna say like, this doesn't seem like it satisfies screening at all. It just seems like it's security. Okay. And I, I, I just, one other thought is, is what, um, I guess what sort of maintenance will occur around those units now that they're open as well. I, I'm not, I, I, I did not get a chance to go to the site. I don't know whether it's, you know, whether it's grass, whether it's gravel, um, since it's now going to be visible. It's paving, it's paving all around it. It's paving, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, I I can support the fence, but I I wouldn't say that this is serving screening purposes. Yeah. Well, I think if we go back to the original uh, condition, it talks about low vegetation or a low fence. Um, oh, that's what I'm seeing on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. type of screening, whether low vegetation or a low fence, and its exact placement will be at the discretion of the applicant. Yeah. And will be submitted to the board for its information at a future date. Chris, at least what we're seeing on the board doesn't seem to give us to ask for us to approve it at all. Um, mm, submitted for information. Is this the right page? It is. This is a page that came after the decision. 
the decision to uh, called on the UU to come in to the board and present a plan for screening, which they did. And they presented the plan for the four foot high vinyl fence, which the board decided met the screening requirement. So now they're coming back to see if you will, you know, allow them to swap out the old fence for the new fence. And I think I'm hearing that you don't feel that the new fence um, meets the screening requirement. Well, we're certainly hearing that from some members of the board, yes. And we haven't heard from everyone yet. So, uh, Susan, uh, would you have any, uh, would you be willing to think about some uh, options that would have more screening function? Um, we'd certainly be willing to think about whatever would, would get this accomplished. Um, we did talk to the architects and, and kind of, you know, noodled around the, the question of, like I said, it's kind of a compromise between screening and security and preventing access to uh, and illicit behavior going on behind the fence. Mm -hmm. so, um, I, I wouldn't really be very comfortable with a full six foot tall vinyl fence. I think we would be inviting um, vandalism and problems when, when everything was fully screened from the, from the sidewalk and you couldn't see anybody in there at all. And, and the model of fence that you have uh, proposed tonight, do you know if the manufacturer oper offers any uh, mesh screens that can be installed behind the pickets? Um, that, that might be sort of partially visible, but not quite, you know, not fully visible? I don't know offhand, but I can talk to um, Hasty Fence. Um, so something that would go a little bit more toward being a screen, but still allow you to see in there. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, how when you buy a window shade, you, yep. can get, you can get different meshes that have different levels of transparency yeah um you know if something you know if there were a metal screen behind it that mm -hmm. might help uh make it less transparent all right so um i think we should why don't we go ahead uh we have and get a motion and just see if people want to continue this or not um, and bring it back. Do we need a formal continuation, Chris, or can we simply uh, decide not to decide tonight? Chris? You can decide not to decide tonight. You could ask Ms. Personette to come back next week on um, the 6th of October, and um, she may be able to come up with some um, addition to that fence that's being proposed that would provide more screening. Uh, Jack? Yeah, I, I, I would move to, you know, close the hearing and approve this. Uh, there's a second. Okay. It's not, it's, may I just uh, say that it's not really a hearing, it's more right. of a meeting. So, so we, could, we could end discussion. We can end discussion, yeah. Do we have a second on ending discussion? A second. All right, Tom. And uh, so we, we're with Jack's motion, we'll go ahead and vote on whether to accept this as a, an acceptable uh, product to meet the condition one of this uh, letter of April 24th, 2014. So going through the list of board members, Maria? Yes. Jack? Aye. Tom? Aye. Andrew? No. Janet? Um, approve. Johanna? Approve. And I am a nay. So the, the motion carries.
um, I think it was five to two. And uh, Suzanne, we wish you luck. We hope we, we hope we all like it. I hope you do too. I, I, I think that the photograph is not exactly um, accurate. I mean, I, I mean, I think it's it will be more screening than it looks like. Can I make one suggestion just now that we don't, uh, we've, we've decided to let you go. Um, yeah. Since the uh, long face of this is, is very oblique as people are walking along uh, East Pleasant Street, um, I think- No, actually you, the long face is parallel to Kellogg Street. Right, so um, I'm thinking of people on, on, on Pleasant Street and how most people are gonna just glance down Kellogg Street and see the short end of this enclosure. Well, actually they won't really see it because of the configuration of the building. It's kind of, you go back to the site plan, it's kind of hidden by part of the building. Okay, well, um, if that's the case. It's a, it's a little nook kind of thing right. in, in back of the building. Okay, all right, well then uh, good luck. All right, well, thank you very much. Goodbye. All right, bye-bye. <clears throat> okay, so finishing, with that we finish old business and turning to new business. Uh, the first topic is uh, the open meeting law complaint and request for minutes. So Chris, do you wanna introduce this? Uh, sure. Um, so you all know that we've been meeting much more than normal. We've been meeting, you know, twice, three, sometimes four times a month. So um, uh, Pam and I have had trouble keeping up with minutes and um, we've received two complaints, one from a woman uh, in San Francisco. Um, she had been asking for um, information about um, the archipelago project. And then um, she was asking for minutes of certain meetings and um, we weren't able to provide them. We did provide her with information about the archipelago project, but in any event, um, she filed a, um, an open meeting law complaint uh, because we hadn't um, had minutes available. Um, and she listed out uh, a number of um, meetings that she would like to have the minutes from. And then um, yesterday we received another open meeting law complaint from Kitty Axelson Berry who was a member, uh, who's a resident of Amherst. And um, she also was uh, complaining that we didn't have minutes available. And um, we have um, probably produced close to half of the minutes that we should have in the last year, but we didn't produce the other half. So we're coming to you um, to talk about this. And we do have um, a, a plan that uh, I would like to talk about. And let's see if I can find a plan. Um, it's basically to, uh, to do a number of different things. And of course, I don't have the document in front of me, um, but it, oh, here it is. Okay, so I guess I should talk a little about what the process is. So somebody files a complaint and then we need to um, present it to the board or the body that is um, the subject of the complaint. And unfortunately, um, that is the planning board. Um, so we've, we've done that. Um, and then we need to respond to the complaint with an answer within 14 business days. And by my count, that would be um, October 11th, but October 11th is a holiday. So um, I'm saying that we need to respond by October 8th. And uh, what we'd like to respond with is... Um, well, Chris, um, oh, yeah. uh, since October 11th is a, is, a, is a holiday, that is not a business day. So I would think it would go to October 12th. October 12th, okay. I'm willing to go along with that, yeah. But I mean, let's see what else you've got in mind. So um, what we would like to do is um, talk about a couple of things. We'd like to talk about what is expected as far as minutes go. We'd like to um, ask the planning board to potentially help us to draft minutes. Um, we are already um, speaking to um, Assistant Town Manager Dave Zomek about getting some extra help. So 
in terms of the details of the minutes that um, that we need to resolve, we've been doing very detailed minutes. Um, I did them before Pam came on, and Pam has continued to do um, you know beautiful detailed minutes. Um, that's not really expected, and most of the other boards and committees in town don't provide minutes like that. Um, and so we're uh, recommending that we do a much less um, detailed version of minutes and just um, really state um, what the topic was, um, you know, a, a summary of the discussion and then uh, list if there were any votes taken and just make it much, much shorter than what we've been doing. Um, so, uh, so that's one, one part of the solution. Um, the second part of the solution is asking if the planning board members would be willing to help us to catch up on old minutes. Um, and we do have a list of the meeting minutes that we're missing. Um, and the third part of it, as I said, was to ask for additional help. So um, Assistant Town Manager Dave Somek has agreed to um, work with us to provide us with some extra help with a person who currently takes minutes for the CRC, the Community Resources Committee, and she's supposed to be very good at taking minutes. Um, so she will be um, going back and listening to, you know, the videos of pre previous meetings and uh, helping us to catch up. Um, ideally, you know, we'd like to catch up by October 12th, but I think that's um, kind of optimistic. Um, but let's see if, um, if we can get some help from planning board members and also talk about the dates of the minutes that are missing. Maybe if Pam can bring that, um, that sheet up. I, I sent out a list this afternoon about that. So Chris, isn't it also true that by, by that, uh, the end of that 14 day period, we have to forward the complaint to the attorney general Yes, we have to uh, along we, along with whatever our our remedy with is. response. Yeah, and I think the response can be this plan that we're putting in place, and then you know whatever we manage to get done by the date that this um, mm -hmm. response is due, we're going to have to respond to the complainant. And now there are two complainants, one of whom um, had her fourteen days start on Monday, and the other had the fourteen days start. Um, the 21st of September. Right. Um, so we and need then, to respond to the complainant and send the, our response to the attorney general. And then when the complainant receives our response, um, that person has um, a certain amount of time. I think it's 30 days um, to decide whether she has received a reasonable response or not. And if she hasn't, then she can file an, a further um, action with the attorney general's office right and as i understand it her the 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 first complaint requested minutes that began on may 5th and went through august 4th so those are the most pressing minutes to be completed uh, i believe there were 10 meetings in that period um, and we've completed the June 2nd and the June 16th minutes. Uh, additionally, the May 19th meeting and the May and the July 21st meetings were uh, in combination with CRC. Uh, and they'll have to have their own minutes prepared. And I believe Pam's involved in that typically. Is that true, Pam? Um it is if it is a joint meeting with the public uh with the planning board i have been asked to do those meetings yeah. uh, those minutes yes so, so they don't so they don't have separate minutes they use our minutes okay so so we probably ought to let pam do the 19th of may and the 21st of july so okay so we've got three hands raised why don't we start with jack Yeah, so I just want to, you know, everybody confirm uh, this is the year 2021. Um, we have lots of technology. <laughs> we have a 
freaking video of our entire meeting. And I'm just, I, I, I'm, I'm like, it's beyond me that we have to type up something that is already within a video with Amherst Media. It, it makes no sense whatsoever uh, to me. It, it, it's upsetting. Um, and then the person from San Francisco, I, I, I don't understand, you know. Well, I, I believe what? the person from San Francisco is a college student who recently graduated from the Amherst High School. Okay. All right. But, but anyway, my, my contention is like, we've had so many meetings this year. It's, it's just, it's off the charts. And we have video by Amherst Media of each and every meeting, factual, you know, and, and so, so I'm wondering, you know, if these, the minutes are really outdated, this whole concept of minutes is this, you know, it, 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 it upsets me because I know, I know how hard, you know, the town staff is, is working and, um, you know, <laughs> Well, I, I just feel like we're, 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 we're regressing to have to put everything in, you know, you know, well, text. That, that, that may be another reason for us to have more uh, briefer minutes that are sort of hitting the high points and uh, the, the actions taken. And then if people want more detail, they can go to the video. Yeah, I mean, there, is, there so, should be a link. There should be a link to our minutes and you know and be done with it but it's like the detail is just ridiculous all right in this so, day and age so. okay well unfortunately the law hasn't changed yet maria um agree with everything jack just said i just want to put my two cents in that um yeah our minutes did not used to be this detailed um there was a point where suddenly there was a request for a lot more detail. And we actually discussed this at length about how minutes are not supposed to be a transcription. And we're, we would ask, you know, if we get a little simplified, it's a little more simpler. And then there was pushback asking for more of the meat of conversations to be put in. I think that's, is, yeah, especially with the year we're in with, um, I'm going to use the word unprecedented times we're in. It's pretty wasteful use of administrative time to have detailed minutes when we have videos. So um, I wrote minutes for tonight. It's literally five pages long for our <laughs> three hours. And when we used to rotate minutes for the zoning subcommittee, which was an hour or an hour and a half long meeting, it was two pages maximum um, until someone decided, you know, we were rotating minutes. And again, suddenly way more detail than needed was put into those minutes. Um, granted, those are not recorded meetings, so maybe that's more worth it. The planning board meetings are literally recorded, and so um, I agree. I, I, I'm my minutes for tonight are bullet points and votes and the salient points that were brought up that maybe led to the vote, but that's it. There's no like back and forth about who said what and everything. And yeah, exactly. I, I, I think we need to provide minutes because it's the law, but they need to be summaries, not um, transcripts. And um, and I agree, Pam and Chris are doing incredible heroic work and we really need to use their talents, places where, you know, it's helping the town get through this pandemic time, not do this busy work. And so um, I, yeah, I was pretty upset by all this sort of, especially people inferring that we were hiding things and, you know, these meetings are all public. They're welcome to come to the meetings. It just, it just, yeah, I left a really sort of sick feeling in my stomach because um, it made, I think, the planning department and the planning board feel, ugh, I don't know, I personally felt like oh, I'm doing all this work already. And so is Pam and Chris. And then here people are complaining. And it's just, oh, I was, <laughs> anyway, that was my two minutes of venting. But um, I, I'm happy to do the minutes in real time. And in fact, I'm probably going to hit send at the end of this meeting. Like, I, I don't want to deliberate about minutes. I, I think we have better things to do with our time. Well, thanks, Maria. And thanks for taking the minutes tonight. Um, I had asked Maria to take minutes tonight so that Pam and uh, Chris could focus on getting us caught up with the other meetings and so that we didn't get further 
behind. Um, Maria, you know, my original comment question was for tonight, um, but I'm sure I I may, uh, if you're willing, it would probably be great for you to continue to do this for a few more meetings until we get this all caught up. Um, so you can let me know, or you know, let Chris and know whether you would be willing to do that. Janet. So the minutes are important and they're a state law requirement and we're not meeting it. And so um, the purpose of the minutes is to, to help document the thinking and decision-making of boards. And they have to be detailed enough so the person who did not attend could understand what was discussed and how the decision was come to be made. Um, so I really think it's very unrealistic to expect people to know that say on you know May 19th, look at the agenda, see something that was discussed, maybe also discuss the next meeting and go and listen to you know, meetings that went on for four hours to find the information they want. And so I think we should, um, you know, that's, that's not a viable option. It's not a viable option. Actually, I go back and look at old minutes too, because I, I kind of get lost a little bit in what we've talked about and when. Um, so we can, you know, it's just, it's, it's a good thing. It's a good government thing. It helps people understand what we do and why. Um, it helps us understand our own history. Um, so yeah, we've been doing tons of meetings, but we've, we haven't been doing, you know, which I have kind of said over and over again, it's too much, we're going too fast. And so I think this is sort of the consequence. Um, on the brighter side um, is, aren't there Zoom transcripts? Because I have been in meetings where somehow you click a button and there's like a, a pretty really good verbatim, this, you know, what people are saying and who's saying it. And so I wondered if we could produce those kind of transcripts that it would be faster to do minutes. Like at that point, you're just editing down or maybe you just get the Zoom transcript and you highlight what you think is important and then delete the rest. So that's a question for Pam and, and Chris. And then I have a third thing to say about like, I think, you know, I, I'm counting like 17 set of minutes, but I think the last two, September 1 and September 14, I think we have like a month to do minutes or three me meetings to do minutes. Um, August 25th was like a really short meeting. So we, we can get rid of that one pretty quickly. And I'm just wondering if we can just do Zoom transcripts on the other 14 and if that's a way to cut to the chase. And I, I do think the CRC people, on transcriber, I've seen their minutes. Um, I think Athena used to do them and they're pretty good, but I'm wondering if there's a faster way to use the technology. Okay, thank you, Janet. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. I'm gonna sort of jump on what, what Janet was suggesting there. One, it sort of feels like these are, uh, I know it's like their weapon, I feel like the intent of this is to like be able to weaponize the minutes for like people wanna be able to see the stuff that catch us on something the the process of taking minutes introduces bias you're asking somebody to make a judgment as to what was said and so i would actually say like why do minutes at all why not just submit the full transcript and say you know what the minute the minutes are the transcripts and there is no bias introduced whatsoever here um it allows us to you know, use, auto, use the technology to generate that automatically. We're not asking people to have to pull up a YouTube site to review it. And there is no possibility of, of somebody misinterpreting a comment that was made because you'll have all of the text. And it seems like that would fulfill the letter of the law and the spirit of the law and would save us all time. I would, you know, just remind folks that the idea of you know, the planning board members going back through and, and taking minutes for meetings. Like we sat through the four hour meeting the first time and to have to like sit through it again to take more minutes, you know, we're volunteers. And I'm not sure that people necessarily understand that um, or, or maybe consider that, right? It's a lot of work. I would say, let's just take the transcripts. I've seen some of them and they're fantastic. The technology is really great. Just do that, say that it's done. And, uh, and then again, we, we eliminate any potential for personal bias. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Chris, do uh, you have a comment about that? It seemed to me sometime in the last year and a half when I was on the board, I did see a bit of a transcript from a Zoom meeting. 
There are transcripts from the Zoom meetings. And, um, but if we were to, for, first of all, you have to edit it. It doesn't come out like, um, you know, real English. Um, and it also doesn't come out in the format of the agenda. Um, but I think they're going to be pretty long. You know, we can try it, um, but I think they're going to be even longer than um, what we're, you know, producing right now. So if you'd like us to try that, we can do that. Um, but I think it makes more sense to go in the other direction, which is to, um, you know, just try to summarize things. And if you look at minutes from other boards and committees, they really do um, summarize the discussion more than, um, you know, say this person said this, this person said that. And, and we've been trying to do that. You know, we've been trying to almost have a transcript because we believe that people would be interested in that. But I think when, when minutes get to be, you know, 16 pages long, which I think the last minutes were, I think that 18th of August was 16 pages long. That gets to be really um, too much. It's too much for a person to put it together. And then it's too much for people to read. And so um, I would encourage all of us to uh, make the minutes much shorter, summarize things and um, put down what the what the votes were and move on. And, and that's, you know, that's the best way to do it, I think. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, Jack, you're next. Me or, or Johanna? I see. I thought Johanna. Oh, was... wait a minute. You know, Johanna and Tom, your hands are almost flesh colored and I don't see them. So, Johanna, thanks, Jack. Thank you. Um, oh, you. You need to move to a room with a dark wall behind you. Exactly. <laughs> or blue or something that is quite <laughs> funny. Um, it seems so. Um, I agree that I think by and large, the recordings of the meetings are quite accessible for a lot of people and that the meetings can be shorter. And um, I personally know I can take at least two of these 17 meetings and do a transcript. So. Oh, great. Um, yeah. And maybe there's an opportunity to do more, but I will volunteer to do that. Okay. And I should comment. Uh, in response to Andrew, I was actually the one that thought it might be that people on the board might be willing to to, to help out on this. So it, I know you guys are volunteers. Uh, so, uh, you know, but if it's not feasible, I know Maria's already said she can't put any extra time in in between meetings, which is why she's it's great to have her helping during the meeting that she already was committed to. All right. So, uh, Jack. Yeah, so I would just, you know, uh, use the technology. You can, you know, for every item that we have on our agenda, we can point to a time within that YouTube, you know, uh, video that Amherst Media presents. Just put that in the minutes, bullet, you know, the, you know, a, a, a general sort of, uh, summary of each item and be done with it. I mean, it, it's just like, it, it's beyond me that we need to actually, you know, transcribe, you know, what we said within, you know, minutes, because this is 2021, right? I mean, these <laughs> minutes probably here, like dating back to 19, you know, uh, who, you know, Come on, Jack. Uh, before, to... before, you know, most of the board, you know, members were born. <laughs> so, um, um, you know, let's, let's do this. I okay. mean, uh, it drives me crazy. I'm sorry. Yeah, all right. <laughs> um. uh, well, a couple of things. One is I'm happy to pitch in as well. If, if I need to pick a couple of these um, and turn a transcription into a minutes, um, I could probably figure out some time to do that. Um, so I'm happy to pitch in there. Um, but but I do think that we can consider a both and and I think um, it would you know since the videos are posted um, it wouldn't be hard to post a link to a transcript underneath it um, that way our meeting minutes could be more brief and concise and at the bottom for a full transcript click here and you get all the stuff so if you really want to know what 
Tom said at 6.47 p.m., you will find out and you could quote me and put it right in the Amherst whatever. Um, but but I think that the, the notion being that the minutes are easy to get through for people to digest the occurrences that happened and the opinions that were presented in a brief and accessible way for the public and for us to approve. And then the minutes or the transcript is there for everybody in the long run. Um, so that would be the way I would think about doing this that seems to satisfy both sides. Okay, thanks, Tom. And thanks for volunteering. Andrew? Tom can do mine. Um, <laughs> isn't that the job of the vice chair to take minutes? I thought. Um, <laughs> I, for, for anyone who hasn't seen a transcript, I had to do that for CPAC. And it's it literally has, you know, the name of the person as you're identified in the Zoom, a timestamp and what they said. And the transcript transcript came out um, really, really well. Uh, it, it came out almost perfectly in the one that I had done. So if folks, you know, hadn't seen that or weren't aware, that's a level of detail. So it's not, it's not just here are the words that were said. It's Doug said this at this time, right? Chris said this at this time. That's all. Okay. Thanks. Janet. So I have a question for Pam. I mean, I, two things is one of them is that given how many meetings we had and all the work that the planning department was doing with CRC and the changes, I, I could see why um, this kind of fell off the table for you and for us. Um, but I'm also wondering, like, just from Pam or like, how, how long does it take you usually to put together a set of minutes? Is it like an hour? Is it two hours? Like, how does three hours, like seven days? I mean, how does it, because you do have that transcript, right? And then you have to call what you think is important. Like, how, does, how long does that process usually take? Chris? It takes days. I'm not kidding. It takes days. Uh huh. Okay. So I, you know, one thing that it's clear is uh, there are different opinions among the board members about how detailed the minutes need to be. So you know, going forward, we may need to vote on whether amendments to minutes should be added or not, or whether we want to keep them you know, following one model or another one. And as we get caught up, I think we should let Chris and Pam uh, generate the minutes they think are appropriate. And then uh, we'll have to decide whether we want to accept uh, changes to those uh, or not. Jack. Yeah, I would just like, you know, if there's some state law that requires us to do these kind of detailed minutes with the technology, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, in 2021, I would uh, support Amherst kind of, you know, asking the state to kind of like revise whatever they have going on with, with regard to the regulations with regard to minutes. I mean, it's just um we need <laughs> it just doesn't make sense to me i'm sorry okay. um we, we have a video okay yeah. all right chris so the state law requires you to record what topics were talked about and to summarize the discussion well enough so that someone who wasn't there at the meeting would know what you talked about and then to record votes it doesn't say that you have to do detailed he said this, she said that, minutes. It's it's really an effort to let somebody know who wasn't there at the meeting, know what was talked about and what was decided. Okay. All right, I don't see any more hands. Um, so Chris, uh, you know, we've had Johanna and Tom volunteer and I'm volunteering to, to pitch in. Uh, would it make sense for you and Pam to essentially assign each of us one or two meetings um, that we could take a pass at this. And um, you know, if you're able to generate the or find how to generate the the transcripts, mm -hmm. uh, we could see. You know, we've gotten some comments from Jack and, and Andrew uh, about how that might help the process. 
-hmm. and maybe even in, incorporate some of that into the minutes in terms of where the transcripts could be posted or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, my 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 first objective is to for us to have a plan that seems plausible and is acceptable to the complainant, so that they don't continue their complaint to the uh, attorney general and things get all kinds of more complicated. Mm -hmm. So Pam is going to be out of the office for the next couple of days. Um, and she she will be back on Monday. So I think, um, you know, we can address this issue full bore on Monday. I may be able to spend some time on Friday um, assigning some of these minutes. And we've already said that Pam and I will work on May 5th and May 19th. Um, I'm the only one who was actually, no, I'm not. But I was the staff person there on August 25th, and the meeting was about half an hour long, so I can do that. Um, but um, I will try to think about what makes sense and look at my written notes and ask um, Tom and Johanna and Doug to take certain of these minutes. I can okay. take a set. I'll take a so, set, so, too. So, ja yeah, Janet. Um, and, and, Andrew, you have your hand up, and then, then Janet. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to let you guys do it and me not, right? I'm, I, I will help, but I would say, like, we should adjust the meeting schedule because, like, instead of having a four-hour meeting next week, I'm going to watch a four-hour meeting of the meeting that I was already in. Like, right. let's protect our time a little bit here and just say it, the cost of doing this means that we're going to have to push back on some priorities. And we're going to push some of these meetings back and and get real about it. Like, right. it's unfair to say that we need to put in an extra, I mean, to take minutes effectively, you need to watch the whole thing because mm. you don't remember, even though you're there, you need to watch the whole thing. And I don't think, you know, while we've got folks who are volunteering, well, you, you, know, know. you might be signing up for another 10 or 12 hours to do this. I know. So I, I would and say cancel my, the next meetings until we my, get it done. My hope is that this is sort of a one-time dig it out and get it done, put it behind us and find a more sustainable way to A, take minutes and B, schedule our meetings so that we're keeping up. And, and then, then we can work on changing the legislation, which is years. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Janet. So I, I would like to, I'll take a set of minutes too. Um, for solidarity and out of Catholic guilt. But um, I, I do wanna echo what Andrew is saying is that, you know, I think what we just did was unsustainable. And the idea, you know, and our meetings went from like three hours to four to five. And so now we're gonna sit down and watch a five hour meeting and spend hours on it. And so I, I never wanna go through a summer like what we just did and at the pace and, you know, I felt like, we spent hours and hours, but I felt at the same time we were giving things short shrift and agendas became very packed. And so I think we should reflect on how things were scheduled and why, you know. And I, I, I you know, it does take a long time to, you do have to listen to the, the meeting again. Yep. Although my wife tells me you can run YouTube at twice speed and still understand it. <laughs> I have yet to know how to do that. Okay, so Janet, I assume that's a legacy hand. Yeah. And uh, I don't see any more hands. Chris, do you feel like you've gotten what you needed for, for tonight? Yes, thank you very much. Yep. Okay, well, so thanks. Thank all of you board members who have who are volunteered to pitch in. Um, you know, Chris, I hope you'll, frankly, I hope you'll give us the shorter meetings um so that you know we have the pleasure of feeling like we ticked off one uh or two um andrew yeah uh, sorry sounds like we're all kind of landing in a similar spot but back to some of the earlier questions uh, when do we need to get this done and will we are we willing to not meet again until the meetings are done so that you know we protect our time uh chris so you've already said you're gonna meet on October 6th to talk about zoning of that parcel behind CVS. And I think there, and that, and that was really it, wasn't it? 
Um, we talked about having a presentation about demolition delay, but there's no real um, need to do that if you don't feel like that's necessary. So we could devote October 6th to that rezoning of, uh, the, of that CVS parcel and, and not have anything else on that night. Um, except maybe minute uh, minutes <laughs> approval if we're lucky take... enough to get some minutes together. But okay. to answer Andrew's question, ideally we would like to have them done by October 12th, but I think that's not realistic. We're going to put together the plan. We're going to send um, these this person who uh, complained from California um, our plan, and we're going to copy the attorney general on that. Um, and we'll just say we'll try to the best of our ability to get it done. You know, let's promise within 30 days. How about that? Does that make sense? It does. I mean, I I would say we shouldn't meet until it's done. I mean, I, I would just get really firm with it and say October 6th, cancel it until we have them done. And if we want to say it's, you know, we, we pick a date where we say it's 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 over. And then yeah, you know, all of the other town priorities that we're working on have to wait. And that's that's I wish you were in critical. charge. I wish you <laughs> worked upstairs. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Andrew. Jack. Uh, I just want to say that uh, you know, I kind of went to bat for us. I I, I feel like this past year I, I added up, you know, just in 2021. The amount of time that we all spent and uh you know minimum was a couple hundred hours and i'm i'm sure some of us spent you know 300 hours uh in in our duties so it's been a uh you know exceptional year and i think you know we should all you know kind of you know recognize that and um you know, and then we're talking about minutes, which is additional time, you know, when we had the technology, it, it just, it, it, it's a very difficult subject for me. Um, because I know how hard the, 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 the town staff, you know, has been working and, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy. And, and I'm glad that we didn't have the meeting last night. <laughs> So I feel like there's okay. There's some recognition there uh, upstairs uh, with regard to what's going on. So uh, again, I, I thank you all. Uh, this is my swan song. I think that my you know uh, Andrew was you know <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, Jack, you're not leaving the board, Jack. No, I'm not. No, but hey. So stop <laughs> stop talking like that. And and, and Doug. <laughs> hit the ground running man you're doing a great job thank you thank you so much <laughs> all right thanks jack johanna thank you doug um i agree that we've been meeting a lot but i also feel like there's a lot that our town needs from the planning board right now and so you know i don't know like I think as long as we're making progress and advancing important things, like, yes, let's figure out how to make it sustainable. But um, I don't know, like Andrew, my thinking is like, let's just solve this problem and then keep doing the important work that is before us. Um, so. Okay. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. Janet. So, so I'm, I'm actually interested in Andrew's idea about um, not instead of meeting next week, just all of us working on our minutes and, you know, we can control our calendar and schedule. Um, and, you know, I don't have a full-time job like almost everybody else here. And, you know, I spend a lot of time working on planning board stuff outside of meetings and reading and researching and all these things. And so I think that the idea of, you know, can we move October 6th to the 20th, I mean, is that a full, you know, night or something like that? Or just can we move things off just to create some oxygen, comply with the law, which, you know, I'm, I'm fond of doing and we have to do. And so I don't, I don't, you know, I think we should just, I think we should take the heat off. Like the idea that you have to work full time, balance your family commitments, have a four hour planning board meeting, and then stare at a transcript and spend, you know, seven hours putting that together. 
sounds like a lot to me. Thank you. Uh, Johanna? Legacy hand, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Chris? So you've already committed to continue public hearing next week on the rezoning of that CVS lot. So I feel like, you know, members of the public are going to be expecting you to be discussing that. And um, town staff is going to be expecting to present that. So I would recommend that you at least have that on an agenda for the sixth and we can say nothing else. Um, yeah. So I, I really feel like it's it would be hard to um, not have that meeting now that you've announced it. Right. Well, I mean, the other thing, I mean, we could also uh, thank Andrew and uh, Janet for their offers and just, but still not assign them minutes so that their, their current time commitment is not increased. Uh, Maria. Um, I, I literally did tonight's minutes during the meeting and I will send it to Chris to distribute and it's basically five pages, although we're not done with our meeting yet. Um, and then maybe you guys can decide as using it as a model of like, here's the succinct bullet point version of minutes moving forward and hopefully it won't take you seven days like it takes Pam and Chris because of the amount of detail that for some reason uh was requested of them um I I I probably will review it just one more time before I send it just to shorten it even more um because I love that idea of you know click on this link to see full transcript or watch the full video um because um yeah, I, I am very put off by, I was worried there was some sort of weird ulterior motive, like they're trying to give us more busy work so we can't push our agendas forward. Like I was thinking, you know, I was starting to think like insanity here because I thought why in the world at this time do we <laughs> need to produce these minutes? What could possibly be the reason for that when they have full access to everything we've been through? So yeah, I, I'm kind of a, uh, sort of mental loss about um, this whole exercise, but I'm willing to just put out these succinct meeting minutes um, and hopefully uh, there is a way to replay things, I think even triple time. And uh, re I've listened to CRC meetings in the past that way, just to get a gist of what they were saying. So um, yeah, one, one big push to get these out of the way so that um, this open meeting complaint, whatever this is called, is remedied and we can move on and keep doing the good work that we're trying to do. I, I agree with them. I mean, Gohana had said, yeah, I, I feel like we should not push on the brakes because I would hate for this kind of stuff to get in the way of the really good stuff that we're doing. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jack. Yeah, I'm just wondering, is there, is there a resolve, you know, with the planning department, you know, Chris Rustrup, to pursue the ability to link minutes uh, to the video? I mean, it, it just, it's just, it's just, our, it's just the way we are right now, you know, and uh, it's, it seems antiquated to, to do a transcript. So uh, I would uh, like for you to pursue that. Thanks, Jack. Chris? So Pam already does that. Pam already puts a link to the video in the minutes. And I think we could possibly, I don't know the details of it, but maybe we could work out a way to put a link to the transcript as well. I don't know, Pam might be able to speak to that better than I can, because I don't understand how Zoom works. But um, yeah, so we'll, we'll do our best going forward. and. Thank you to Maria for um, taking minutes tonight. That takes a burden off of us. Great. All right. So, um, Jack, is that a legacy hand? No. Okay. So I just want to say uh, there there is a way to pinpoint within a, a YouTube video the time for each item, and you're done. You know, you just it's just the, the technology is there, and I, we should use it. Because it will, you know, it, it's 
is the best for all of us, <laughs> you know, and your staff. So, you know, we're item, you know, number one, it starts at like, you know, 30 minutes, you know, you know, 40 seconds. And you can just, you know, to tag it and it's there. I mean, I know Andrew is, you're, you're pretty savvy on this. So maybe you can add that, but. Thanks, Jack. Andrew? No, I mean, you're right, Jack, it can be done. I, I was um, I was just gonna say, Doug, first of all, like, I appreciate you, you know, insulating some of us, but like, I, I'm all with the solidarity and like, if any of us are doing it, like, I feel responsible to do it. Well, I mean, Maybe, you know, we all have different obligations and I know you in particular do a lot of travel. So, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I want to be sensitive. I, and I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, maybe I was going to say, maybe we can cap the meeting for next week. We do have the, uh, the outstanding item there. Maybe we can say like, we'll wrap it up by seven 30 or something like, you know, really quick and we can yeah. all be punctual with our comments, with our comments uh, would help a lot. So. Okay. And then, oh, I'm sorry. The other thing I was to say is, it's just for the assigning of minutes. What could we just make sure that um, uh, we assign to people who are present at that meeting um, would would help a lot? I think because as you go through them, you, you definitely remember the meeting you're in, and if you weren't there, then it's it's going to be a lot more mental energy expended to to get caught up. That's a good point, uh, Chris. On the subject of next week's meeting and the presentation on the CVS lot. Um, do you think that we could predict the what a reasonable cap would be? I mean, we're going to have some sort of presentation from Nate. My guess would be that it would be at least two hours, but you might be able to you might be able to get away with an hour and a half. I think you're going to have members of the public wanting to speak about it. Uh huh. And and I'm sure something in Nate's presentation is going to be controversial or will arouse some comment. So, so you know, I think, um, I guess my question, I guess for the board would be, can we leave it to Chris to, and, and, and Pam to take a look at the length of the different meetings and maybe try to parcel them out in a way so that, you know, nobody's getting the, the five hour meeting we had on, you know, July 21st. Um, but, um, you know, maybe Andrew and Janet get some of the shortest, you know, one short meeting. And, and then you maybe some of the rest of us who had a little more capacity, uh, maybe get one or two meetings. And, you know, it, let's, let's see how you how you can do that. Mm -hmm. Can, can we leave it there for tonight? Yeah, yes, definitely, yep. All right, does anybody else wanna say anything about this before uh, Chris goes with Pam to think about how to get us through this? All right. I just wanna say thank you. Well, thanks, Pam. Thanks for everything you've been doing. All right, so, um, Moving on in new business, do we have any topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior? Chris. So, um, yeah, uh, so Doug and I uh, worked on the um, report to town council on uh, supplemental dwelling units or ADUs as we've been calling them. And um, so we sent out the report to you all this week. And um, Janet responded with um, quite a number of, of, um, of suggested edits. And I would like to say that I agree with um, many of them and would be happy to incorporate them. Um, but I do not um, want to rewrite the public hearing uh, portion of the um, report. And um, there are a few things that I don't agree with. So we can go through with these um, comments bit by bit if you want to. Pam has access to the, um, the edits now, or uh, the board could leave it to Doug and me to um, edit it as uh, we think is reasonable. This needs to be done 
really soon. It has to be submitted to town council by Friday. And I um, also have to write a report on apartments. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that a little later. But um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So many of Janet's comments were good, well thought out things that I think should be included. Um, some of them I don't agree with, and I would consult with Doug about whether to include them or not. Um, so we can either do it with that method or uh, the board can go through these um, comments with us right now. Okay, um, Janet? I would love not to go through these right now, um, but I do wanna say that um, being a veteran of five years of town meetings where, we, um, where planning board reports are presented to town meeting and then trying to explain zoning changes, um, listening to explanations of zoning changes to, to lay people, I was really conscious of that. And so, um, so I thought in a way the way this report was too long and read like you'd have to like that you kind of have to have a really good strong grasp of what was going on as you read it. And so a lot of my things was to put right in front of the town council, what are the changes? And the goal, the goal of the change, like in the front. And then um, I felt like sometimes the changes were sort of alluded to, but not explained and things like that. And so I was really trying to be very specific about here's how the law changes. And I think the report did that really good about 60% of the time, but left other things out. Um, and so I put a fair amount of time to put into this. I actually have, I'm about to start a four day class. And I would be happy, like if this thing turned, like if you accepted changes and we looked at it again, I'd be happy to work on it a little bit more, maybe tomorrow night. Um, and I don't think I have time on Friday, but I do think um, the part that was really hardest for me and seemed long to me was like what felt like read like minutes where like this person said, this person said, that person said, and I thought that it was not really great to name people's ideas and attach to them just that the ideas themselves are more important than the comments were. But I also thought that the town council would just get lost in reading back and forth of this back and forth. And I wonder if that could be summarized better. And I understand that takes time. I didn't have the time to really do all that, but I do think that, um, I think it's important to get to lay people the complexity, complex zoning changes in, in terms that they can understand and then say, okay, I like that, or this is the part I don't like. Um, and I, I've never seen this with the red stuff accepted, so I haven't read a final draft of my own edit. So I'd, I think I'd hate the idea of doing this right now, but if Doug and Chris wanna take a stab at it, I could look at it again tomorrow night. I'm happy to do some more editorial help on that. All right, thanks, Janet. Chris? So um, one of the reasons that I included um, names and what they said um, in the first draft here was as a result of a criticism that I received on a previous report to town meeting that, or town council, I keep saying that, um, from a counselor um, that she really wanted to know who said what, you know, and if I made reference to uh, the board talked about this and they talked about that, or who said it, you know, so that was a response to kind of, um, you know, really lay it out in detail. And I don't have time to rewrite that section of yeah. this report. And I don't, I have too many other things to do. So my um, approach to this would be to accept um, probably 75% of the comments that um, Janet has made and not accept others and um, just send it in by noontime on uh, Friday. And I, as I said, I have this other report. Um, and and I, I guess I should also say, and this has been a tough week for me and for Pam, given, you know, the really difficult way we started the week with the complaint of the open meeting law complaint. Um, but um, I forgot what I was going to say. My mind is, you know, not working as clearly as it could because I'm clouded by this cloud that's hanging over us. Um, but I do have a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done between now and Friday. 
and I just don't have time to um, rewrite most of this. So anyway, I'll do my best. I'll send it to Doug and I'll send it to Janet and she can look at it tomorrow night. And then if there are a lot more changes after that, we're just not gonna be able to accommodate those changes. And, oh, I know what I was gonna say. I remember now because um, Maria and other members of the zoning subcommittee used to write these reports a number of years ago and the staff didn't write the reports. Prior to that, Jonathan Tucker wrote the reports and the planning board would see them or not see them, but they would go right to town meeting. So um, at one point in the last few years, the zoning subcommittee took it on themselves to write these reports. And um, so we may wanna consider doing that if, if people feel strongly about uh, what needs to be included in them and what doesn't need to be included. Um, anyway, so just to wrap this up, I will do my best to, um, to accept the uh, changes that I feel need to be accepted and to ship it off to Doug and I will send it to Janet and we'll see what we can produce by Friday morning, but um, I'm not gonna be able to devote hours to this. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Janet, is that a legacy hand? Yes, yes, sorry. Okay, Maria. Um, I didn't send any comments when you asked for the comments, Chris, because I thought the draft report you wrote was just fine. So sorry I didn't chime in with that, but I, I thought it was ready for prime time, honestly. All right, thanks. So it sounds like we have a plan for getting this completed. Um, you know, Chris will do as much as she can and I'll get a short amount of time to look at it and, and hopefully Janet will too. All right, so that's uh, I think the end of that topic on new business. Do we have any form A and R, A and R subdivision applications? We do, unfortunately. <laughs> All right. Pam will bring it up. Actually, before, while you're bringing that up, does anybody want to take a, a, a break again or not? Okay, we'll keep going. All right, so this A&R has to do with um, the property that's shown here, um, the old Starbucks building, which is now I don't even know what it is right now. And then the building next door to it, which is um, Bistro 63. So um, we'll show you a plan of the site. And um, this is the plan. And is this the plan? This is not the plan with the new, with the old lines on it, is it, Pam? Um, Here's, show, no. the colored, show the colored one. The lines that they added are here. Okay, so but flip to the, this one. one. Is okay. Yeah. This one is easy, easier to read. So the two properties are the one that's outlined in yellow and the one that's outlined in blue. So what the intent is, is for um, the owner of the property outlined in blue to give the um, little leg at the top of the drawing, uh, in other words, the one that's outlined in red and blue to the yellow property. So the yellow property will get bigger and that's Bistro 63. Um, the one that's next to it is owned by Mauro and Yellow who used to have um, a couple of restaurants in town. Actually, I think he owned Bistro. But anyway, he's uh, holding on to the, um, the portion on the left and, and, um, and Bistro is acquiring that portion on the uh, top. And so if we can go to the a and R plan now, um, we'll see that I guess there are, yes, I see existing lot lines is, is labeled there. So they are there very faintly. Um, and this plan is showing what the proposed lot will be. Um, so there's lot one, which is 4,069 square feet. And there's lot two, which is Lot two, which is 5,438 square feet. So what you will be um, saying here is that this does not, um, does not consist of a plan that needs to go through the subdivision uh, control approval. Um, in other words, it is subdivision approval not required or ANR. So you would be authorizing Doug 
to sign this um, plan on behalf of the planning board to acknowledge that it does not require subdivision approval. All right, thanks, Chris. Chris, you, you cut out when you were explaining what's moving to what on this plan, this, this map. So I, I kind of missed some piece. So okay, well, let's go back to the colored one. Yeah, the L-shaped parcel, the top of the L, yeah. transferring over to the yellow parcel. Okay, okay. So thanks. the yellow parcel would become a T-shape. Mm -hmm. Yep. And is this in is are these connected buildings in reality or is this no like, no okay Pam so can you show the front the picture again yeah they're separate structures is the plan to to take that building that white building down and build on the back of it or something is there do you know what their plan is to do with both either of these buildings um we don't know what the plan is. Hmm. Uh, any uh, any comment from the board? Any objection to allow, having me sign this on our behalf? I see no objection or and I see no hands. So Chris, can we consider that to be approved? Yes. All right. Next item, upcoming SP, SPR, SDB applications. Um, I can talk about a, an upcoming planning board application, which I'm very sorry I've um, neglected. It's a, an application that um, Rob Mara put forward for um, a parking lot similar to the one that he showed you, um, the Sweet Alice uh, Trail parking lot. Um, so somewhere in my email is an application from him to have another parking lot approved for the town. And that will be coming to you probably in late uh, October or early November. Other than that, I am not aware of any applications, but Pam may be. Pam? I'm not aware of any um, planning board applications, but there are some things coming in front of the ZBA if you're ready to hear about those. So these are applications that are going to come in front of the ZBA on October 14th. Um, the first one is um, has to do with the South Point Apartments. Um, that South Point Apartments has actually been um, bought. So the existing special permits that were granted to the owner Yas Rex for construction of a new 47 unit building, um, they have to be um, transferred over to the new owner, which is going to be Redwood Construction Inc. Substantial construction has not started on that new building. Um, and so that's why they can go this route. Then the other three applications all have to do with the very same thing. And that is um, they are all requests to have a condition from their special permits removed. The conditions all say this permit shall expire upon change of ownership or management. And so there are going to be three of them. Um, one is for property at 19 Phillips Street. One is for property at 204 to 206 Belcher Town Road, and the other is for 192 to 194 Belcher Town Road. So basically, if the ZBA grants these um, condition removal requests, then the existing special permit can just continue under a new property owner. I did ask um, Maureen Pollock if she knew what was happening with these properties. Uh, and she did not. She said that it was not specified. All right. That's that. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports. Jack, you want to say anything about PVPC? Yeah, uh, I unfortunately uh, had a work commitment, uh, so I missed the last 
executive uh, committee meeting, but the quarterly meeting uh, is scheduled for uh, October 14th. Um, but we had you know, like an emergency meeting with regard to Kim Robinson and uh, she's the director of the Pioneer Valley uh, Planning Commission. And she has done a stellar job, just amazing. And um, so, you no, know, it was recommended that, you know, she had a, uh, <clears throat> you know, recommended for, for a salary increase and um, that was unanimous, but um, basically, yeah, that's it. And, that's I, it. and I'm actually gonna miss the next meeting. <laughs> Because I'm going on vacation at the end of October. <laughs> all right. But, um, that's all I have. All right. Thank you. Andrew, CPAC. Thanks, Doug. Uh, we have not met since uh, the, the, the initial meeting in August. Um, I do know that we've got three applications so far. Uh, two of them were for uh, housing and one was for recreation. Um, I not have a chance to read to read through those, but I know that the uh, that um, the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust was uh, responsible for those two um, the two proposals relative to the community housing, and then the third one was uh, I think related to simple gifts farms. Um, again, I haven't had a chance to read through them, but be happy to uh, provide details on those in future meetings if folks are interested in hearing about them uh, just let me know all right thank you i have nothing to report on the ag commission tom uh design review board sure no yeah no surprise on the ag commission there huh um <laughs> can i take well, I, I gotta put uh, myself on mute here <laughs> the drb did um we had four things to look at last week. One was the fence that we just reviewed um, for the Unitarian um, Society. Um, the second one was the um, parking lot that Chris just mentioned, which was the Pigcock Coal Conservation Area, which is in North Amherst, um, which was approved as well. Um, it's, it's basically the same as what we saw. So, you know, it's the prototype of uh, Sweet Alice being repeated, which is great. Um, and then there were two signage projects downtown. One was um, signage replacing the high horse for the Drake. Um, so signage on that uh, particular building, which was pretty straightforward. And then another simple signage swap for where the Kaiju um, awning is that goes down into the basement. The, most one of the most high turnover locations in all of Amherst that every three weeks has a new something, um, mm -hmm. some new signage on the awning there. Um, so that, that was some pretty simple stuff that was all approved. Um, and uh, it was a very productive and fast meeting. So um, figuring out how, we, how can we adopt those practices and bring them over here. But um, anyway, we'll see. All right, let, let, us know, let us know if you have any tips to share. <laughs> well. Uh, so, uh, Chris, uh, CRC. So the CRC met on Tuesday. Yeah. Is that right? Yesterday. It seems like a long time ago. And they talked about, um, zoning amendments. Um, and they briefly talked about, um, the rezoning of the parcel behind CVS. They didn't talk about it in any great detail. Um, I think, um, you know, they're knowledgeable about a new, uh, concept being brought to them. And um, the other things I think I will save for my uh, staff report later because they all have to do with um, zoning, except for um, the other, the last thing was talking about Article 14. And Article 14, if you'll remember from last summer, was something that we um, put in place quickly to allow uh, restaurants to operate either on the sidewalk or in the street to um, accommodate the fact that people were worried about COVID and they weren't able to eat inside. So the thought is that um, we may want to extend Article 14. I think Article 14 extends as far as December of this year. So it, it 
works through December, but then uh, the, the governor has put in place a similar uh, or something to allow outdoor dining through um, through April 1st of next year. But we acknowledge that you know, people aren't really going to be eating outside between December and April 1st. So anyway, we would like to put something in place to allow outdoor dining to continue to occur um, during 2022. So um, the CRC did discuss that. And the other part of my report, I'll save for my report. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Report of the chair. Uh, the chair hasn't done enough yet to have a report. Um, but uh, thanks for letting me try this out and I hope uh, it works out. Chris, report of staff. Okay, report of staff. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little about zoning and um, how it's kind of evolved. Um, and this is, this is a result of the fact that the planning department was feeling very um, uh, unsettled about certain zoning amendments that were being moved forward. And um, we felt that it was necessary to take a little more time to look at them. And um, so I'll list them in, uh, in order and then we can talk about what's happening with them. Well, the one that we didn't feel anxious about was ADUs. And um, so ADUs are moving forward. They're being considered by town council on Monday night for a first reading. And um, as we said before, uh, some of us are working on getting that um, report on ADUs to town council. Hopefully we can do that by Friday at noontime. Um, mixed use buildings, um, we have uncovered some concerns recently with regard to the clarity of the description of the non-residential uses and potential um, uh, problems with interpreting the bylaw. And um, so we would we we went to um, Mandy Johanneke and we talked to her about uh, these misgivings that we had. And um, so what we agreed to was um, to bring uh, a new um, a slightly new uh, rendition of mixed use buildings with a couple of tweaks um, back to the planning board uh, on October 20th. Um, and then the CRC, which is required to, um, the town council is required to act within 90 days of the CRC uh, closing its public hearing. And the CRC closed its public hearing quite a while ago on mixed use buildings. So they're going to have to hold another public hearing, which is going to be on October 26th. So anyway, that um, particular bylaw is still in flux, but you will see um, a slightly revised version of it on October 20th. Um, apartments, the apartments bylaw also ran into um, a kind of a, a little bit of a snare. Um, we took the apartments bylaw that the planning board had recommended and we went to CRC about um, two, I guess it was two weeks ago. Um, and they made a change to it that we really didn't agree with. And so um, we told them that we would like to have an opportunity to work on it more. And they said, well, okay, but we would like you to put through um, the portion of it that changes the permitting um, for apartments in the RVC zoning district. So that was going from special permit to site plan review in the RVC zoning district. And the, they also wanted us to put through the portion that goes from site plan review to special permit in the BG zoning district. So, um, so apartments is being brought to town council on Monday night. Um, and that was something that I just uh, understood on Tuesday. So anyway, that's why I haven't written the apartment's um, report yet. But um, so those, just those two aspects of apartments will be brought to town council on Monday. The change in the RVC from special permit to site plan review and the change in BG from site plan review to special permit. And I think the intent there is that um, we want to make it more easy to develop apartments in the RVC zoning district. And we want to um, make it less easy to build apartments in BG 
and therefore promote mixed use buildings instead of apartments in BG. So the idea is that the CRC will um, be holding another pub, oh no, they won't need to hold another public hearing on that. So that's just that small piece of apartments that's going to town council on Monday. The rest of apartments probably won't be acted on until next year. So we have a lot of time to think about that and talk about it. Um, the parking bylaw, it, it became clear to us that people didn't understand what we were trying to do. So um, we, we need more time to be able to explain the parking bylaw to people. Um, and that included members of the CRC. They really didn't understand what, what the purpose was, what we were trying to do. So um, again, the CRC is going to hold a new public hearing on November 9th. But we would like to bring it uh, a new, well, maybe not a new version, a slightly tweaked version of the parking bylaw back to the planning board on November 3rd for discussion. And then uh, town council would have a first reading in December and a second reading in December. And then the CR CVS parking lot, um, the planning board is still can, has its public hearing open, but the CRC needs to hold a new public hearing on October 26th. So the planning board is going to continue to talk about it. CRC will continue to talk about it. And it's expected that town council will hold a first reading in mid-November mid or early December. So that's the latest news on zoning amendments. Um, so we're, we're in a little bit less of a rush to get these things through. And we're hoping to have more time for conversation and um, you know, further consideration and make them better than they were previously. And, and much of this is um, based on things that we heard at the meetings, you know, people who spoke, members of the public who spoke. So that's that's my report. Thanks, Chris. There's plenty going on. Jack. Uh, yes. So, outstanding job. Doug Marshall as the new chair. <laughs> I mean, I just, amazing. So, and then uh, kudos to the vice chair, Tom Long. Amazing. <laughs> you guys got this. So, uh, I, I, I'm so happy and, and, and I'm proud of there this. you are. <laughs> you know, the cocktail. <laughs> And, you know, of course, Chris, you know, and Pam, you know, you guys, I just, you know, working in overdrive. Um, thank you for, for navigating us, you know, through this, through this time. So thank you. Okay, Jack, thank you. Janet. So it sounds like the planning board won't see the apartment, it's its own report to town council on the apartments change i will send it out when i have it ready it probably yeah. won't be ready till the end of the day tomorrow um so the planning board will see it it's going to be um not as lengthy as it had been as it had started out to be since the town council will only be seeing this one portion of apartments i'll try to capture the um, the flavor of the discussion leading up to the decision to just have this one thing go before town council, but it's really just going to be focused on that aspect of the change. Um, so one thing I think um, is, is, is I think it'd be really good in that report to, to clearly explain the change between site plan review, scrutiny and consequences, and then special permit. And so there's, you know, they obviously require, you know, everybody has to comply with the whole bylaw. Section 10 with special permit has sort of extra criteria and sort of extra powers for the board administering it to, you know, move things around. And then site plan review has, you know, review. Um, and a, obviously the board can condition but then there's consequences in terms of like who makes the decision, who gets to, you know, the planning board gets site plan review. Um, once the site plan review permit is get issued, it, the appeal period starts with the building permit, with the special permit. It starts, I think, 10 days after the special permit. So I really think like this is that chart I keep on asking for is like listing out what the differences are. 
between these two routes through the bylaw. And so I don't know if you have that, but I, I keep on asking for that. And I think that for lay people, it's sort of like site plan yeah. review is by right. And that kind of just sticks in their head and they don't understand there's like really different analysis or special permit gives you extra control and analysis. So I don't know if you had that chart handy or, you know, kind of we can pull it off or something, but I do think lay people don't understand the differences between those two permits. And, you know, when we take something out of special permit, that means that a level of scrutiny does not happen. So that will not happen in rural village center zoning. And the ZBA will no longer handle that. It will go to the planning board for a lighter hand and a little less control over the project. So I, I just think that that's the kind of thing I, I want to be in, the, in a report or just for us as a board or showing to the public, like here's the actual consequences of this move that just looks like a chess move, but it has a lot of real life ramifications. So anyway, it sounds, it sounds impossible to do by Friday. Yeah. Uh, what you've outlined, what you've outlined for just, you know, your work in the next, you know, two days, but how did we get here to be on this track? And is this- yeah, It's taken so, all year. Is this so important an issue to like push through to the town council, like moving RVC or do you know what I mean? Well, it sounds like some of this came from CRC. Chris, do you want to comment at all? Yeah, so I just wanted to invite Janet to send me um, language that describes what she just said, because I, um, you know, after this week, I may not be able to retain what she just said, and I would like to include some of that. So please feel free to send me that language, and I will try to incorporate it. All right. Thanks, Chris. So I believe we have finished our agenda. I'm hopeful this is not going to be a typical meeting length. And uh, we will try to, it sounds like we really only have one thing on our next meeting agenda. And you really would prefer that we not cancel next week's meeting. Mm -hmm. So let's try to be easy on Andrew and Janet at least uh, in terms of the minutes and the schedule for completion. Uh, with that, uh, can we adjourn? Thank you. All right. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Night. Good sleep. All right. Bye, Jack. Bye, guys. Where's the recording? Oh. <laughs>